right, well, welcome everyone. This has been already just a beautiful morning. I, uh, the energy in the room, being together, we were just reflecting, Eileen and I, on how isolating practice can be. We can sometimes be the only play therapist in a school, in a community, um, sort of fighting for the right to help children. And uh, my hope is that this time today, we'll be able to both deposit some sort of big picture ideas, but also give you some real nitty gritty stuff. Because as a play therapist, you know, myself, I love the toys and the tools and the, the nitty gritty of how do we set up environments that create the neuroception of safety for children and families. Um, we do a lot of toggling back and forth uh, at Nurture House between theory and then putting skin on it. We actually talk about it as safety with skin on, right? We are, we get to be, for some of the children that we work with, the very first source of safety in their lived experience. And my hope is just to encourage us all in the very powerful, important work that we do today. So, helping children speak the unspeakable. Um, I, it's important, I think, that I share a little bit about my evolution as a play therapist because I think it will help frame the way I think about things in this work. When I went to college, um, and it's so surreal because I have a child now who's uh, entering his senior year in college uh, in the fall, and Madison, my 18-year-old, will be going off to college for the first time, and I really thought what I wanted to do was go and be a Broadway star. That's what I really thought. I, triple threat, acting, singing, dancing. Um, so I got a double major at Duke University in drama and psychology, which I like to um, joke, uh, equip me to do very little at all afterwards without some advanced training in one way or the other, um, and sort of hit a crossroads where I decided therapy was really the, the service I wanted to provide um, for my life. And um, at that time in Tennessee, in the United States, there wasn't very much play therapy training at all. And um, I, I, I often reference it like I've been doing this work for 25 years, but I just, as I was sitting there, was like, okay, that was 1994. Wait a minute, that's actually almost 30 years. So at that time, 30 years ago, there was very little. And so my first job, um, I didn't have any equipping in advance. I just got this job that was the assistant counselor for a, a little community mental health center called Dee Dee Wallace. And um, uh, the assistant counselor was a very glorified position where I drove the van. <laughs> And so I would drive the van into the inner city uh, schools, uh, neighborhoods, and pick up those children, bring them to our community mental health center, and we would do an hour and a half of group therapy every afternoon. And um, when I say group therapy, it was not play therapy. There was a lot of, at that time 30 years ago, particularly kids with big behaviors, we did a whole lot of behavior management with them. That's what we did. So there were all of these little checklists with, you were nice to your friend, here's one point for that. You were, I sort of cringe now when I think about some of what we did early on with the children that we serve. But there were magical moments on the playground where the children would be spontaneously interacting with one another and in a way facilitated by me, and magic would happen there when they were given the freedom to play. And so I um, chased all over the country trying to figure out how do you do this work with children. And my initial training was in uh, child-centered play therapy, so a very non-directive approach. And I set up my very first play therapy room in a therapeutic preschool environment, which was all three to five-year-olds who'd been kicked out of their regular daycares for hitting and spitting and biting and throwing chairs at people and all those things. And to a one, they all had trauma in their histories. Many of those children were helped, and I just finished doing a three-day course in the Trauma Play Foundational content, and there's example after example of the beautiful healing work that children will move towards often on their own if they're just given the witness and the holding presence of a safe place like ourselves, and also the vocabulary, the words that they need in the language of the play. This is, play is the language 
language of children. And many of those children did move towards healing on their own. However, there were subsets of children that seemed stuck in some way in the play therapy process. And over the years, what I have come to understand much more deeply is that some of our children are so mired in avoidance symptoms related to trauma that they can come in to a fully child-centered playroom and pursue some attachment enhancement work, social competency building, self-esteem enhancement, all of those good things, but they can still actively avoid the terrifying content. And so I continued, I, I thought there must be more out here around the world. And so I continued to go different places and train in different models and have become what you would call an integrative play therapist now. And trauma play is an integrative model. And I, if I have a soapbox, it's this. I believe that if we say, if I, if I say, I am a purple play therapist, this is the way that I do play therapy. What is likely to happen eventually is that a child will come into my playroom and what I will end up saying about them is, this child is not helpable instead of, I have not yet found the best way to help this child. Right? That is, in my mind, an integrative model and what undergirds and supports what is really a very yes, 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 and yes sort of approach to this work with children. We're working to find ways to follow the child's need all along the way in therapy, which means that we continue to stretch ourselves all along the way, right? So the stretching that we continue to do is to hold hard stories for the children in our care. And this is, I would be curious what yours is. Some of you who are with me did this work in clay and in plasticine and so forth this weekend, but this idea of, uh, I don't know if you know the Incredibles movie, but Elastigirl can stretch her arms way, 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 way far. Um, and so my symbol for myself, when I am in the midst of a session or a family's crisis where I don't know what to do next, I don't know where to look next, or even how to breathe in the room with the child, I will work to take the breath anyway and pull up this image in my mind of what I'm trying to do in holding the hard story. So stretching our arms as far as we can and continually working to do that around the fire that may be in the family, in the child, in the parent-child dyad. I am curious, just take a moment. I'd invite you just to look inward for a moment. What is yours? What is yours currently today? It may shift over time for you, but what would be an image for yourself of your stretched capacity to hold the hard stories for children in your care. And when you get an opportunity, perhaps when you're back, you know, in your next supervision session or when you get back to your playroom and you have a quiet moment, ha, 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 in our playrooms, that you could do that work in three dimensions somehow with clay or drawing or sand tray miniatures for yourself. So, um, I have now written lots and lots in the field. The next book that I want to write is called Tell the Truth to the Children. Because, at least in America, we are having a very hard time doing that with our kiddos about all sorts of things. And I thought we would just, you know, I have been um, working with word clouds a little bit. And so I just created this out of some of the... Um, the things that grown-ups find it very hard to talk about, to name, right? And if you look at that word cloud, you might find words that are still challenging for you. We all have places where we are stretching our growing edge of what we can hold and what we can name. And the idea that Children, when there is a vacuum of silence, when a child does not know, they have a felt sense. Their autonomic nervous system has experienced whatever it is that is so very scary. But when the grown-ups are afraid to name it, when the grown-ups are afraid to bring it in the room, it becomes doubly terrifying. 
And so how do we help children speak the unspeakable and how do we ourselves speak the unspeakable when it is needed? And there's, the good news is there's really lots and lots of ways that we can do that. I think what I'll do is start by, and I, I promised this little girl years and years ago that I would always show her video when I'm doing any training. So let me say before we get started that um, whenever I'm showing any client content, and there's quite a bit of it um, that I show in these workshops because I feel like it's the best way for me to learn is through other people's stories and case examples. So uh, I hope that it is also valuable to you. But it is uh, offered I'm offered the great privilege of doing that by my clients as they understand it's just within this small space with you all. It's not to be taken outside the room. We don't take any pictures or video of it. We will be editing out anything that might be being recorded in the, in the time before it's shared more publicly. So um, the other thing I think I will ask is that you all, normally when I'm teaching for long, long periods of time, we use a phrase phrase called dual attention, where I say, this is a moment for dual attention. And what that means, because I share so much trauma content as a part of my teaching, I kind of um, almost feel really remorseful about some of my early teaching when I would sort of fire hose people with case examples of trauma. We did not understand the way we do now, how much vicarious trauma secondary traumatization, compassion fatigue, we can have as a result of the work that we do. And so it is not my intention. I never ever want to fire hose people who are absorbing with me again. And so in the moments when I'm sharing a case example, I would normally say this is a moment for dual attention. In this keynote, there are just so many moments that would be like that. I'm just gonna give a broad um, you know, invitation to you at the beginning of our time together that um, you might wish to look out the window at the beautiful golf course or to shift in your seat or to have a drink of water if you have water with you or some, some way to listen with part of yourself to the hard things I'll be sharing. But then with the other part of yourself, do whatever is needed for your own self-care. If you are scrolling on your phone for a moment while I'm sharing something hard, I will not be offended by that. I will see that as you having dual attention. All right, so this little girl was one of my first teachers and I was working in an inner city school and she came in wearing the same clothes she'd been in the night before, which that by itself was not that big a deal, but she also was bouncing off the walls, which was not her normal state of being. And so I pulled her aside and I asked her um, how she was, you know, what was going on. And she was able to give me, and here's the trauma play bias, she was able to give me the top level linear linguistic narrative pretty quickly. She was able to say, my mom went out to do her second job uh, and she forgot to leave a key under the mat for us, so my sister and I slept on the front porch last night. Now this was in a very dangerous neighborhood where there were drive-by shootings every other day. So it wasn't, and my experience of this community had been that they were pretty, they took good care of each other for the most part, so it's unclear to me why the girls didn't go and, and stay at someone else's house that night, but they did spend the night on the front porch. And so this little one uh, was able to share the words of that story, but that's not integrated, right? Affectually, somatically, relationally. It's just one glance at it. We have children who can say with their words, my daddy shot my mommy and then he shot himself. That's a version of the story, but it's not really speaking the unspeakable the, the thoughts, the feelings, the sensory impressions, the relational ruptures that are captured whenever we have an adverse childhood experience that comes into our playroom. So what am I, you know, I'm not gonna try to therapize her right away, right? So she hadn't had any food, I don't think, so we made sure she got a good breakfast. She also hadn't had any sleep, or if any, it had been hyper aroused, kind of hyper vigilant sleep. So we first put her on a cot in a dark room and let her sleep for a good couple of hours. And only then do I bring her to the playroom. And even then, I don't say, tell me more about the scary thing that happened. I say, this is the special playroom and in here you can do almost anything, you know, we give our spiel. She went directly over to the child guitar and picked it up. 
And she started going like this. Bong, bong, bong. Bong, bong, bong. What's she doing with us? She's modulating, right? She's, she's externally modulating her internal chaos at that moment. She's, she's working it through in the musical instrument itself. And I do know that you all are trained in use of, of musical instruments, so you already have them in your playrooms. Um, it, it's a very important tool for being able to provide repetition and that external modulation for children. It is one way that children begin to speak the unspeakable is through their use of the musical instruments. She's taking this chaotic, frenetic, I'm, I don't know what to do with all this energy, I'm, I'm so scared and ah, and trying to work it out, trying to regulate. She did that for about 10 or 12 minutes. And then I say, can you make up a song? And so part of what's happening there, and we'll get a little bit more into uh, you know, neurobiology and, and bottom-up brain development, but really what we're doing at that point with the music is really regulating the brain stem, right? That's the work that we're doing. And as she's regulating the brain stem, I join her in it. And when I do this, I'm looking at the limbic brain and the connecting between us, between she and I. So she's as she's going, I'm going, and as she's going, bong, 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 I'm going, and we're starting to join in that way too. So now there's regulation and there's connection. And only then would I work in any way to invite words back into the process, right? So we're working left, right, cross hemispherically continually. We're working bottom up and top down and bottom up. We're really trying to thread the needle with these children up and down and up and down until they have a full integration of what has been so hard to speak. So even then, I don't say, tell me more uh, about the scary thing in the song. Make a song about the scary thing. I just say, make up a song. Um, and this is the song. So it hurts inside, it hurts inside, it hurts inside so bad. I don't know if I had just tried to engage her in talking about what had happened for her, if, if any of that would have been emoted, if there would have been room and space for her to be able to begin to make that sort of an integration. We don't, in normal conversation, I'm not likely to sit with Monica and say, she asks me how I am and I say, you know, I'm, I'm a little tired. And that, I, I'm not likely to say, I'm really tired, I can't tell you how to, we're not likely to repeat ourselves, right? In fact, we can often be seen as kind of um, irritating to others if we repeat ourselves in conversation. But music, chants, chant, rhythm, dance, Poetry all allow us to have iterations of bringing mind and body back together in different sorts of connections. It is one of the ways that we help children speak the unspeakable. So I want us to look, we're going to spend, we're going to kind of go on a bit of a journey this morning. We're going to, oh, and I should say, um, because of the, the uh, three-hour keynote and, and Monica, her introduction and the awards and things, um, I've been asked to let you know that you can take your comfort break whenever you wish. And you guys who've been with me for a while already know, if you need to come up here and lay down or stretch out or wiggle your back or whatever, like that bottom up regulation, we're gonna do that first. So anytime, there's not going to be a 15 minute break where everyone gets up uh, and leaves the room at the same time, but you may get up at any point to do your comfort break. Is that, do, Rebecca, do I have that correct? Yeah, I think that's, that's what I was told to share, okay. So, the scaffolding for the story. How do we help build a story with a child? First of all, we create safety. Then, we bring in the delight. And I really do believe, guys, that delight is the primary change agent with children. We have the whole 20 core therapeutic powers of uh, play and the, and the change agents and all of that, and we can spend a great deal of time working with those and identifying them in the playroom, but delight in a child or a family system who has had the the joy leached out of their system. What they need back first is the delight from us. 
And then we offer voice. We find all sorts of ways from musical instruments to microphones to clay to sand to, to amplify the voice of the child. And it is with that sort of scaffolding, that three-pronged scaffolding, that I think the story can become integrated for children. So trauma play is, those of you who followed my work for a while, it used to be called flexibly sequential play therapy in this first uh, dark playground here that looks kind of hopeless. Um, play therapy with traumatized children. Flexibly sequential play therapy was the name of the model. Uh, and it was, it is meant to be flexible, um, but also based in best practice understandings of sequencing things, right? So obviously things like uh, assessing for and augmenting adaptive coping are going to happen before you try to open up a hard thing for a child. If there's, if you want to know what's going to happen, right? How they're going to cope, and if there's any additional safety staff that they needed first. However, people who trained with me for 10 or 15 years would say, you know, we, when we're talking about S, when I'm doing S, 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 you know, that model, they couldn't remember the acronym, and neither could I, honestly. So a few years ago, we decided we would rename it Trauma Play to capture the marvelous juxtaposition between understanding the neurobiology of play, the neurobiology of trauma, and the power of one to heal the other. And that's really what the crux of trauma play is. And so over time, we've made sort of deeper dives. The core components of the model, which I'm not going to explain all of them to you, but they are right here, the core components of the model. We're going to spend time in looking at post-traumatic play and some of the ways that that can look today. Um, but I'm going to back up for a second and show you. Uh, the first book is the core components. This, this next uh, trauma and play therapy is looking at this whole play therapist palette of mitigators in the approach to hard things with children. So you may be in the middle of play with a child and they've danced and played right up to the edge of what they can do in their trauma work today and they may abruptly have a play disruption. In fact, it's very cool in your own training to um, watch videos back without the sound and look for the moments where there is an abrupt play disruption for a child. If you go back and you turn the sound back on, you may see something very important that was happening just before this play disruption. Children will dance towards and away from the trauma content with you um, as we titrate the dose of exposure for them. So there's lots of ways that when they're feeling like they they need a break or when they uh, are, are um, have danced right up to the edge that we do something else. We need meat. We offer a drink, a snack, some food. We move from the indoor environment to the outdoor environment where it's warm. I actually was sitting quite right under a vent and my whole body was starting. I was so, so cold. It would be a loving hug to me. I would feel deeply loved if someone would take me outside into the warmth of the air right now. So there, there's a whole set of mitigators. My guess is each of you as developing and developed play therapists have your own set of mitigators on your own play therapist palette. Um, trauma and play therapy just offers a few of those. And then we found that there were children who were still getting very uh, they were just still stuck in a process. They did not seem to be moving. And part of what we recognized was that the parents were not being invited in, in partnership, in the ways that might be most helpful for a child. So we have now expanded a whole, um, I mean, you know, days and days and days of training just on how it is that we might integrate parents as soothing partners, both as co-regulators, uh, providing them psychoeducation about trauma for sure. But sometimes we can be working with parents or teachers. And I do think when people come through trauma play training now, they'll come through the foundational and some of them who are school-based will say, I don't know if I need the advanced because isn't that more the attachment pieces and the co-regulating parents as partners, caregiver stuff. Um, and I think actually school may be the most important family for children once they are school aged. They may spend more waking hours in their classrooms at school than they spend waking hours with their parents at home. And so particularly in the elementary age years, the classroom that a child is in, those kids become their siblings and the teachers become 
the parents, the safe bosses or not, of the classroom in ways that are really meaningful for that child. So understanding ways that we can expand a caregiver's capacity to meet the child in the trauma is important in the work as well. And then this final, the most uh, recent resource I've developed is called Big Behaviors in Small Containers. And I just, I'm so pleased with the, uh, the cover that they've made here because it really is, I think, the crux of what happens with children who have been traumatized. They will often have very big behaviors, either externalizing behaviors that are kicking and screaming and throwing things, um, sharpieing couches and maybe, maybe even smearing feces on the wall, things like that. They may also have equally big behaviors that are collapse or death feigning behaviors. They are shut down withdrawal behaviors. Those are less squeaky wheels. They're not likely to be as seen within the schools and as noticed as quickly by teachers as the externalizing behaviors, but they're equally big. And what our grown-ups tend to see first is the big angry monster, right? That big red angry monster. When really, Inside that big angry monster is this very vulnerable, hurt child. And then we do a lot in the middle there in that shadow part of calling the child's behavior different things. We might call it PTSD or oppositional defiant disorder or ADHD or we have many, many kids that are still being misdiagnosed with ADHD because when we go through some of the hyperarousal symptoms of trauma, uh, hyperactivity, impulsivity, inattention, all of those things can look just like ADHD if you don't yet have the story of what happened, the story of the trauma that would make sense of why we're seeing those things when there's not an organic um, reason for the ADHD to be there. So underneath the whole model is this question of what is the need underlying the behavior? What is the need that hasn't been met here yet? And we spend our time in the playroom working to meet the needs that have not been met, which sometimes mean that we're taking a 15-year-old and they're going all the way back to very, very early play because they missed that play. That is the need that needs to be met here. And in all cases, we are working to follow the child's need, right? So in these components of the model, and again, I'm not gonna spend our time this morning trying to go into every single one of them. We are going to spend our time together sort of in here today, the continuum of disclosure, experiential mastery, play, and trauma narrative. But obviously, enhancing safety and security comes first. Things like assessing for coping and augmenting adapting, adaptive coping, soothing the physiology. And part of that is the parents as partners work. Part of that is the co-regulating caregivers work. The younger a child was when a trauma occurred, particularly if the trauma occurred in utero or at pre-linguistically before speech was really available in any kind of powerful way for a child, then the co-regulating caregivers are going to be even more important in the work. And, and so as I was, you know, when I share this information, we, we often go through every core component and, and uh, spend a great deal of time um, outfitting each of them. Um, Alicia, uh, and I've forgotten her last name, and I feel really bad about that, but Alicia's, uh, um, uh, she work, she's one of the Mama Owls minis people. She makes miniatures now. She's a super creative person in the States, and she makes these amazing miniatures for the sand tray. And she was listening, she was in a training of mine some years ago now, and she made this uh, drawing while I was talking about the fluid dynamic nature. We want to be able to, we don't want to be so mired in the, this is the way I work that we can't follow the need of the child all the way through, which means we might be working in one play therapy approach for part of the time that we're with a child and move into another when another thing is needed, which is this stretching I'm inviting us all to of continuing to learn and grow and integrate the cutting edge information in the field on a regular basis. So if we think about this like the, the parent and the child and the therapist or in a school-based program, possibly the teacher, the child, the therapist, and you pull back the knob and the ball goes up, 
we're first always going to be working in enhancing safety and security, right? That has to happen. And then there may be some coping or soothing the physiology. When kids are like little whirling dervishes, they're not regulated enough for us to do any of the, the deep work is the regulation work at that point for kids. And then eventually they're going to move down the pinball machine into some post-traumatic play or some play-based gradual exposure that's going to happen. What often happens then as a child is touching more deeply the scary stuff is that they may become dissociative. They may um, back up or, or blank out in any number of ways. That doesn't mean you didn't do your job right till that point. It's just that scary. And there may need to be a bounce back up into soothing the physiology again, right? We often use this tool with... Um, with uh, supervisees and when they feel like they're stuck in a case. And as we work this process and say, okay, you spent this many sessions, you were working in this sort of way it feels like, and then over here. And what we'll see is that often the parents as partners piece uh, over here on the left was missed entirely. The parent or the teacher has not been invited in as much to the understandings of trauma and what it does to the brain, what it means for the child, and or any of the ways that a parent or teacher could help in those capacities. Um, so we, we, we just want you to understand the fluid dynamic nature. This is meant to all be clinical tool for you, for you to use your own nuanced clinical judgment in using the trauma play model. So we begin, you know, the first concepts when we're looking at helping children speak the unspeakable, we have to understand some about how trauma is stored and how it's processed in our bodies and what might have happened in a child's development based on the number of traumatic events they may have experienced. So you're all familiar with the ACEs, and I was talking to somebody, I think it was Alan at dinner last night, that the teachers here, there's a trauma-informed caregiving model, and, and um, most teachers know about the ACEs now the adverse childhood experiences. What I think is more challenging for teachers to absorb is that an, if you think about the adverse childhood experiences, uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, domestic violence, um, incarceration of a parent, uh, divorce between parents, substance use, sub substance addiction, mental health issues, all of, all of these adverse childhood experiences have one thing in common. They all take away, they remove the attuned caregiver in the position of the serve and return dance that parents and kids are supposed to be doing from the very beginning of life, from the moment that a baby is put in mommy's arms. And I will use that word mommy as a catch-all phrase, perfectly understanding and acknowledging that some of the mommies in our practice are primary fathers. The father is the figure who is doing the bulk of the caregiving. It might be a grandparent, an uncle, a cousin, a big brother. I'm going to use the term mommy as the catch-all for all of the primary caregivers in a child's life. From the moment the baby is put in mommy's arms and the baby goes, ah, goo, and the mommy goes, ah, goo, from that moment, that baby begins to learn that they have a voice and that they matter. And the delight, the play, is between them from the very beginning. And the delight that the parent gives to the child, eventually the child begins to give it back. And there are shared moments of delight. And that child's neural system is being wired to have excitation, moments of excitedness in the play with the parent, and then soothing in the play with the parent. And that happens over and over and over again in the first year of life. And if it doesn't happen, then this is what we see instead. So I will, and this is a, it's a pretty quick way to help teachers and parents sort of shift paradigm if you're needing a, a something to do that. So if we look at the upside down pyramid, the child who has had a good enough caregiving environment um, and is now three and a half years old, the three-year-old does not worry about what they're going to have for dinner or if they're going to have dinner. It's, a, it's an of course there'll be dinner tonight. They don't worry about will they have a place to lay their head. Of course their blanket that smells like the fabric softener that they use once a week when they wash the blanket is going to be available to them. Right? So there's not much of their brain space that is needed for survival. So there's a lot of leftover capacity for a typically developing child in a good enough caregiving system to regulate, 
to grow socially and emotionally and to learn cognitively, right? But if we look at this, when developmental trauma has occurred, when there have been three or four or more ACEs, then we're going to have a brain, let's say you have a four-year-old, uh, let's say it's a seven-year-old who is, God bless you, um, uh, maybe in second grade and is being sexually abused in the night and then goes to school and has to pretend all day, every day that they are fine it's so taxing to their neural system, this incongruence that they are having to manifest at school every day, that all of their brain is being used, the bulk of their brain is being used for survival. So there's very little left over for learning how to regulate or social emotional growth. And then this tiny little cognitive piece on the top, if you think about the old school food pyramid, like the little part that should have been the fats that we eat each day, that's all that's left for cognitive development. And the more we can shift parents and teachers' understanding to this is why it is very difficult for these kids to learn their ABCs and their one, two, threes. So this is my very, those of you who've heard me teach before know this is my very, very favorite brain slide. And um, the questions, the very elegant pairing of questions with the triune brain um, was Becky Bailey's work in her model conscious discipline. So this, this reptilian brain stem that we know is responsible for heart rate, respiration, body temperature, all those autonomic functions, it is always asking the question, am I safe? The limbic brain, with the amygdala kind of tucked in right here, is always asking, am I loved? And only if those questions, am I safe and am I loved, are answered with resounding yeses, can the neocortex do its job of asking, what can I learn from this? Now, if that is true of our ABCs and our one, two, threes, it is equally true, even more true, of our traumatic experiences. That becoming regulated and then becoming connected with a story keeper, someone who will hold that story with us, are necessary before we can ask the question, what can I learn from this? In fact, <clears throat> This was the slide that when I was, I was doing a professional development talk for one of our inner city school, the teaching staff, and, um, and that they looked at this and they said, first they said, amen, sister, and then they said, um, they had just had, I knew that something had happened because I, when I pulled up in my car, there was a group of three children, siblings, I think, all holding hands, and I watched them walking into the building and they stopped and they stepped over something together. And I wondered what it was. And then when I went up to the sidewalk myself, I saw a brownish, reddish line on the pavement and thought, that looks an awful lot like blood. Uh, and then later, as I was sharing this slide, the teachers let me know that there had been uh, an interpersonal violence episode on the sidewalk in front of the school. And these kids, their housing project where they lived was a few feet away from the school. So there's no time within their school day, there is not enough time for them to get safe enough and loved enough for their brains to go, how can I learn from this? So these children were not, they were having a very difficult time doing their ABCs and their one, two, threes. So the amygdala, I want to take a moment to talk about it um, because it's super important in the work that we do and it explains a lot about why the kids that we see have such big behaviors. So the amygdala is an almond-shaped cluster of cells in the midbrain and I'll tell you, this new version that we have, Amy G. Dalla, that's her name. She has beautiful eyelashes, doesn't she? She, uh, she was created by a nine-year-old boy um, at Nurture House, and I, I, it wasn't my client, it was another clinician's client, but I walked into the art room one day and there was this like almond-shaped wad of duct tape that had Google eyes on it and big eyelashes, and they had built, this clinician and child together had built a house, a safe place for the amygdala to heal. And, uh, and I didn't, you know, I had to go figure out whose it was and understand the story better. And then they helped me uh, turn it into an intervention for big behaviors. But the almond-shaped cluster of cells in the midbrain is sort of the seat of um, 
somatosensory memories as they relate to heightened emotional experiences. So if you have um, really crystal clear, joyful memories in your life, the day you got married or the day your baby was put in your arms for the first time, you probably have some crystal clear sense memories related to that. So the smell of your new baby's head or the taste of the wedding cake. And if that is true of our joyful memories, it is doubly true of the things that terrify us. Our brains are made to scan the environment for signs of danger continually once we have experienced danger. The thing is that the amygdala can also be a sloppy processor, right? If you get punched once, then the next time a fist comes at you, you want to be able to get yourself out of the way. But caregivers, especially, don't always understand what it is that's happening in a child's big behaviors related to trauma because they haven't understood the amygdala response. So I'm thinking of a a grandparent couple that were raising their nine-year-old da granddaughter. And she, one at the intake, I was just asking about, are there any times when she gets really, you know, out of bounds? She gets upset with you. And she said, well, she just did this morning. And she said, she's just, and, and our grown-ups will sometimes say these things about our kids. They will say, she's just a spoiled brat. Or she's just, she just wants what she wants, and she just can't take no for an answer, and all those kinds of things. So this grandmother was espousing some of that. And I said, can you give me an example? And she said, well, yeah, just this morning, she, was, um, she wanted a toaster pastry, and uh, she wanted to put it in herself. So I let her. But then when it popped up, the toaster was hot. She was about to reach for it, and I, you know, and I took it out, and I, I kind of moved her hand away. And she threw a fit on the floor for 20 minutes, like, I want to get my own toaster pastry, screaming and yelling because she couldn't get it herself. At that moment, I don't say anything to the grandmother except I become story keeper with her and hold the frustration of that, the difficulty of that for her, but I write it down. And then later, as we're talking about the amygdala alarm and I'm sharing that with grandmother for the first time, I wonder about that toaster pastry. And she immediately, I mean, she, it didn't take very long for her to make the paradigm shift and to say, you know, we did just find out recently that her other grandmother, before her other grandmother got sick, who she'd been living with, her other grandmother would lock her in her room in the dark if she was bad and would slap her across the face. I think maybe when I grabbed her hand away from the toaster, she thought, her brain thought I was going to hit her. Huge paradigm shift and really important for this grandmother to see her granddaughter differently, to see the suffering underneath this big behavior, right? So the amygdala alarm can be a really important part of um, how we unpack, how we give permission for idiosyncratic, quirky trauma symptoms, trauma behaviors to be present with kiddos. We do that, we keep one of these guys in every room of Nurture House. And we say, let's pretend like this guy is in Iraq, and his job in Iraq is to take care of the tanks. So he's over there working on the engine of the tank, and uh, he hears gunshots, bang, bang, and he drops to the ground. And his heart is racing, and his body freezes, and he doesn't move till it's all over. And when it's over, he gets up, and he checks himself, and he's safe. His body slows down. He goes back to work. The next day, he didn't fix the engine problem. He gets a buddy. He and another soldier are out there trying to fix the tank. And again, gunshots, bang, bang, and they both fall to the ground. The buddy gets a little bit hurt because he doesn't fall quite as quick as our guy. He's OK, he just needs a Band-Aid. But our guy's safe because he falls so fast. And that happens day after day. He's out there doing his job. Gunshots, he falls to the ground. He's protected for a whole year's tour of duty. Then he comes back home and he's been hanging around in Nashville now for maybe like nine months. He's been doing his corporate job. He's been playing with his kids on the weekend. And he's out at the mall doing some um, shopping, some present shopping for Christmas. And he's laden down with packages and he's walking in the parking lot to his car and he hears a car door slam, bang. What's he going to do? And five-year-olds, if you tell the story with the right inflection and offering a prop as a, as a um, kind of base for them, an anchor for the learning, five-year-olds will say, he's going to dwop to the ground. <laughs> you don't say to a five-year-old, your brain becomes habituated to the trauma. Right, you don't do that with five-year-olds. 
But you can give permission for the littles and for their big people to have idiosyncratic, quirky ways that trauma symptoms look. It also doesn't mean that those symptoms are going to be there forever, right? Our brains and bodies just need help metabolizing them. And I would say that play is the digestive enzyme for children that helps get to work digesting the trauma, keeping the learning, the pieces of whatever's happening that are part of their very important story but then letting go of the rest. So that's the amygdala alarm. The other thing I want to just remind us of, if you work with these kids, you already have felt this in your own body, but for traumatized kids, the, um, the ex excitation response, the excitement they may feel, aggression and anxiety can all balance on the head of a pin neurophysiologically. Right? So we have to be careful. We're always working with children within their window of tolerance and then working to stretch their window of tolerance, which we can do with play therapy in amazing, beautiful ways, right? Just sword fighting together can be an upregulating, or putting on a piece of music and dancing together can be an upregulating, exciting experience. At Nurture House, getting on the magic carpet swing and wrestling their bodies up from a sitting position position to a standing position on that swing and captaining the swing is very exciting to their neurophysiology experience, but it might kick right over into aggression or anxiety very quickly. So we're constantly learning with kids. And I just think this is the coolest, um, that's, a, that's a matchstick there, and that is art created by some amazing artist uh, that is teeny, teeny, tiny. And it is really what I think is happening. There's a neurochemical boxing match happening but within a child who's having massive amounts of cortisol, stress hormone released related to the traumatic events, and the oxytocin and dopamine, the other neurochemicals, the bonding chemicals, the joy chemicals, we can facilitate them being released in play. It's a powerful way to bring healing to children. So there are also three roles in the trauma play model that we're always working to embody as a trauma play therapist. Um, we used to call it the triad of therapist roles, safe boss, nurturer, and story keeper. And then one day, and I don't know if this happens for you guys, but it definitely happens for me, I'll have different silos, like different bodies of knowledge, and I can be very one track this way, oh, this is, I know I understand this stuff, and then over here I understand this stuff. It wasn't until very recently that I went, wait, 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 what we understand about bottom-up brain development and this triad of therapist roles, they really do work together. And so when the reptilian brainstem is asking the question, am I safe, we are, as play therapists, moving into the safe boss role. That might include things like having a um, consistent, reliable, predictable space for them. It might include responding in predictable, reliable ways with them. It might include limit setting. I, those of you who've been with me for several days have heard me say this a lot of times now. I believe that sometimes the first work is the boundaries and that kids need boundaries like they need water to live. Some of them really do and they can't do any of the other work in the playroom until they know that you're gonna keep them safe enough that they can't hurt you themselves or anyone else, right? That's where it starts. And then the limbic brain is asking, am I loved? We move into the nurturer role. And we do things like offer a drink when a child is thirsty and offer a snack when a child is hungry and offering a loving touch or say hello to their beautiful brown eyes. That's all a part of the work that we do. And then when they're finally ready, their neocortex is asking, what can I learn from this? Then we can become story keeper and help them make a little bit more coherent, integrated sense, potentially on a top of brain driven process, right? Um, so those are just all framing um, the work that we do at Nurture House and in Trauma Play. The cascade of care 
What we want to be doing is taking these three roles, safe, boss, nurture, and story keeper, and embodying them so deeply as therapists ourselves that we have them to give to the other caregivers in a child's life. So I want to be safe, boss, nurture, and story keeper for the parent and safe, boss, nurture, and story keeper for the teacher. And this can be super hard um, because teachers and parents can come at us like, why aren't you helping more? Or I tried this and it didn't work. Or he's just such a little hellion. I just don't know, I can't stand to be around him. Parents do get really exhausted and disgusted with their children. But for us to show up in a way that can hold their story while also getting underneath it to, that must feel really yucky to dislike your child at this point in time. As a mom of three, I, I know that that feels really yucky. And then the tears come from the parent. But we first join with the parent or the teacher in the way we want them to be able to join with their own children. right? That's what the cascade of care is all about. And then in order to do this, it's not once that we do it or twice that we do it, but we're doing it thousands and thousands and thousands of repetitions of times to wire the brain for what we want to see more of. The slide that I used to have in here was 700 neural connections per second, and I would go like this, 700, 700 more, 700, I mean, which is already more than our brains can even understand, but the center uh, for, on the developing child at Harvard just changed recently in the last couple years and said, hey, we actually were wrong about this. It's way, way, way more activity happening, synaptic connections growing in the child's brain. So every moment of time that we spend with a traumatized child giving delight, need meeting, engaging in serve and return behaviors with the child, attuning to them, every single moment it takes these sort of rivulets in the brain and it begins to wire them more and more deeply, right? So safety is the treatment, and uh, Stephen Porges, who's the founder of polyvagal theory, um, talks about this uh, lots and lots, that safety is the treatment. And our you know, polyvagal theory, um, I, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a taste of it uh, in just a second, but we can neurocept safety, danger, life threat without any conscious awareness that we're doing so. If you've ever, I mean, just, just, walk, just in the grocery store, just doing your regular grocery shopping, you may walk past someone in the grocery store who you feel like really drawn to and you can smile at them and you all have a little chit chat about how much the tomatoes are costing this week or whatever. And then you walk on another aisle and there's somebody with a really grumpy face in there and you just you kind of just stay away from them, right? We are continually working out who, who and what is safe for us and where is their danger or life threat. For children, the more adverse childhood experiences they've had, the more moments where there has been distrust within the system of care, where the safe boss has not been safe and the nurturer has not been nurturing for the child and no one has kept their story. In those moments, that child doesn't even have a wiring for what safety looks like. I had a kiddo who, um, there's this intervention we do sometimes called postcards, thank you, Elaine, called postcards in motion and it is, um, we first, it's like a titration of safety for a child. So we take a little postcard sized piece of paper and we say, let's pretend that you are in a beautiful place you'd like to visit. Uh, and then, and if a child doesn't have even that much template for safety, we'll get on Google images together and look at beaches and rainforests and whatever they might be drawn to. Um, and then we'll say, can you draw a picture of this vacation spot, this place you'd like to visit, and then we'll do some things on the back of it too. I had one child who, what they drew on there as their vacation spot, their safest place, was a rat infested hut on a deserted island. That was their safe place. And that was this, and I got the deserted island part of it, People had not been safe for this, uh, it was a teenager, people had not been safe for this kid, so it made sense that he wanted things to be isolated, he didn't trust anybody. But with that kind of a, a metaphor, when a child brings us a rat infested hut, 
We might do some things. We might begin to say, let's imagine that we're in your hut and it's, um, and there were holes in the ceiling too. And, and you're, you're in your hut and you're ready to go to sleep and then uh, it starts to rain. What's, can, we, can we imagine together what would that be like? And this kiddo went, um, oh yeah, yeah, I think I'd get really wet and it wouldn't be easy to sleep. Okay, hold on. And he went and got Play-Doh and he stuck some Play-Doh into those holes in the, the hut. Uh, thatched roof of the hut. And then I said, and, and how about food? What, what do you eat here on your deserted island? And he said, coconuts. And so he drew a coconut and he said, I ate half of it. And I said, so, so those rats. And he said, oh yeah, the rats. They're going to eat the rest of my coconuts, so I need to, I'm going to make a door for the hut. And, and so you see how there's little tiny titrations of beginning to build up a sense of even what safety would look or feel like, because some of our children have not had it. They have no template for it whatsoever. So we become the safety, and the safety becomes the treatment. So the vagus nerve, I'm going to take a moment to, to talk about it with you because it is sort of, um, you know, it's one of the new ways of thinking about what it is that's happening neurophysiologically for us within our autonomic nervous systems. So it's a polyvagal theory is a hierarchical and evolutionary um, point of view in which the vagus nerve, which is this 10th cranial nerve attached to the base of our brain, has branches to it, one of which runs way down into our gut and can immobilize us. So if we think uh, about long, long, long time ago um, in the old days, there would be uh, giant creatures roaming the earth and maybe the little creature would be um, busy eating its own food and not paying close attention. And so the big creature gets right up on top of them and the little one um, doesn't have time to choose anything. They're about to be eaten. And so they, they death feign, they collapse. And maybe the big creature decides it wants fresh meat and not an old carcass, and it's adaptive for that creature to have immobilized, to have shut down. We talked about this in our training this weekend, because, or earlier in the week, because this is the experience of many, many, many of the children I work with who have been sexually abused. When a child is being sexually abused in their home environment, there really is not much choice available to them, right? So the immobilization response happens when there's a neuroception of life threat. There is no choice available to you. The little ones can't mobilize. You know, the, le the next layer up, our sympathetic activation system, you know, fight or flight, and when the blood rushes to our heart and the uh, air rushes to our lungs and we get ready to do something sympathetically, um, that's a mobilization response. When we see the creature coming from a distance, but we have time to choose, time and agency, to make a choice about how we respond. Sexually abused children need that parent to keep feeding them and housing them. They also, if they were to fight back, so they can't run away, if they were to fight back, it would go worse for them, right? There might be more physical hurt in the midst of the sexual abuse. So the immobilization becomes the genius of the disembodied self. It's really a brilliantly adaptive coping strategy for many of our traumatized children to quiet themselves to dissociate, to put themselves in the, I've had more kids than I can tell you say, I put myself in the ceiling and watched from a distance, right? So immobilization, mobilization, and then the hope of polyvagal theory, which I think is so cool, because we used to think it was just the gas and the brake. So we need to be running and our um, sympathetic arousal system is, you know, all freaking out. Or if we can, and can't do that forever, we'd slam down into um, a parasympathetic state and calm or collapse or whatever. And then now we know, though, that other parts of the vagus nerve are actually attached at the base of our brain and in our inner ears. And we have this social engagement system that has evolved over time for us to co-regulate one another, us to remain in a posture of social engagement and safety 
even when there is the kind of life threat that might otherwise immobilize us or the kind of danger that might mobilize us, make us want to run away or fight back, right? And guess what? Play is the neural exercise that allows this process to be honed for children. When we are sword fighting together, it's a sympathetically activating experience for our bodies, but children remain connected with us through this social engagement system, and that modulates, mitigates this excitation response so that the aggression doesn't take over. They get to play on the edges of aggression because that's what we're doing in the playroom. And it's delightfully mitigated by you, by the play therapist in the room. The same is true with being safely still. We all want to be able to rest in another's arms. But many of the children that we see have not had. I don't know, have you ever seen, have you ever gone to visit a, a new mom and their baby? Especially if it's the first baby and they're not having to run around and take care of older kids too. There's sweet moments where there's just a lot of gaze happening. The baby is just gazing at the parent for sometimes very long periods of time, just learning. I often wonder what is going on in that baby's brain while they're doing that. And then the same is true for the parent, gazing back. That is the safely still, and we can play with safely still states too. When traumatized children are our clients, that's a lot of the work that we're doing when we talk about regulation. That's really what's happening. So our autonomic nervous system is always listening inside our bodies, outside our body. So what our body is telling us from the inside out. And most of the time, traumatized children do not have an understanding of what their bodies are saying to them when they start treatment. Um, they're not paying any attention to the racing heart or the twisty tummy or their teeth gritting, whatever it is that happens for them. Our autonomic nervous system is also always listening outside our body. So what is my body was speaking to me very loudly about the air conditioner vent, right? The external environment. What is, is that regulating to us or dysregulating to us? And then we're always listening between bodies. So are you safe for me and am I safe for you? That all three of those processes, interoception, inside the body is called interoception, outside the body is exteroception, and then between bodies is this social engagement response and how we make sense of our lived experiences. So at Nurture House, we're constantly, and so these are some of the first concepts we work with when we're working with traumatized children. You'll hear about 100 times a day at Nurture House, your body is letting me know or your body is letting you know, or what is your body letting you know? The first time I say that to a kid, they say, what are you talking about? And I'll say, well, I think I'm feeling a little bit cold. I think I might need a blanket. I'm feeling a little bit cold right now. And we stop at the front door of Nurture House before we go into the treatment rooms. And we have an area that's got a kitchen, and it's got um, apple juices in boxes, and it's got bottled waters, and it's got a gumball machine, and it's got lots of different snacks of different kinds. And we, we check in, in Terracept. What do our bodies need? Do we need to go to the restroom before we go in a treatment room? Do we need a drink, a snack, a snuggle with your mom before you say goodbye to her? Do you need to be warmer or colder? What is needed for you? So kids become, over the time that they're at Nurture House, very savvy about their own bodies. And I love it. I love it so much when a kid is you know, graduating. They're like, you know what? My body is telling me that I'm going to miss you. Uh, and I'm like, my body is telling me that too, buddy. How's your body telling you? So we spend a lot of time on that. And, and this idea of interoception, I love this quote. If you listen to your body when it whispers, you won't have to hear it scream. When you listen to your body when it whispers, you won't have to hear it scream. And I think that this is entirely true of the traumatized children that we see. I think it's true for each of us in our own person of the therapist work. If we don't listen to our body's depletion, so this whole idea of vicarious trauma, if we don't listen to the depletion that we're experiencing and do something to fill ourselves back up, I, you know, I think, one way to look at this idea of stretching ourselves to hold hard stories is, is it's fair to say, really, Paris? You want us to just keep stretching and stretching? You know what a balloon does, right? You stretch it and stretch it. 
So if we're going to stretch ourselves and hold this much trauma for other people, there has to also be a way that we siphon off. Right, so I would encourage you just to be thinking as we talk what those might be. Are there any ways currently for you in which your body is screaming at you because you haven't listened to the whisper? And if not, are there any ways, in fact, you know what? I think we got time. I'm gonna ask you to just take a moment with your, with the buddy sitting next to you. Is there any place in which your body is whispering to you that you are carrying too much right now or doing too much exercise or not eating enough or having too much coffee? Is there a way that your body is whispering to you that you need to listen to? Ready, set, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a case example related to this idea of interoception. Because I want you to be able to um, take away the, you know, it, it seems like a nice idea that we should understand what our bodies are saying. But it's more than a nice idea. It is a critically important way that we help to keep some of our clients alive. So this is a young lady who came to me as a cutter she was referred for cutting. And one of the first things I did was try to help her with her interoception. So what does your body tell you? What is your body doing just before you cut? And she said, I don't know. And I said, I, I believe that. I think let's, let's figure it out together. Let's be detectives together and figure out what it is your body says to you, how your body signals you before you start to cut. And so she did that for a few weeks and she came back and she said, okay, uh, my teeth grit, my tummy twists, and my heart starts to race real hard. And then I cut and I feel better. And I explained a little bit about when you cut the oxytocin that gets released and that kind of calm moment of time you may feel. And, and that was new for her and kind of like, oh, so that I'm not just a terrible person who hates myself because I do this. this, this is serving some sort of purpose for me. And then I offered her a red pen and I said, uh, can you, for the next little bit every day, at least once a day, when you feel that jaw t tensing and your tummy twisting and your heart racing, can you just um, write on yourself? So notice I'm not saying don't cut because saying don't cut is taking away a strategy that has been adaptive for her in whatever way it has, or she would not be doing it, right? So it's been important for her, and we don't wanna just rob teenagers especially of their tools, um, but we just wanna offer them new ones. And so she begins to write on her arm, and this first, this is the first day she sends me a picture and she's got all of these hash marks she's made with her red pen. Uh, and then she also writes the words, help me. Um, and she has the word numb on there, reckless, those kinds of words on her arm. Three weeks into her doing this every day, she's still making the hash marks on her arm with the pen. But now she also has the words individual growth, not a broken spirit, um, uh, dreaming, dreaming big dreams, and then hearts and smiley faces and some other symbols. So she is starting to be able to allow space for some of the, the other parts of self to make themselves known. And eventually she is able to take better care of herself. One of the other things I love to do when a child comes in with some cutting behaviors is to take very good care of their bodies and to give them Band-Aids if they need, to lotion the hurts if they need. I don't say stop cutting. I don't make them sign a no cutting contract. The people this earlier this week got to hear all about that. Um, but we want to build the, the child or teen's awareness of what their bodies are telling them. And this is all parallel process, by the way, with the grown-ups. So the parent needs to better understand what their body is telling them. When what they see instead of their four-year-old having a tantrum, is their tummy twists, their heart races, and they back up from their four-year-old because what they sense is a neuroception of life threat. They overlay their domestically violent partner on the four-year-old, right? When that's happening, the parent is gonna need some help shifting that, 
growing their interoception in order to be able to respond differently to their child than they have to this point. There is this unconscious dance, and I have three children, all teenagers and young adults now, of my own, and the number of times when, especially as teenagers, they have a part that is activated in them, and then it activates a part in me that I don't necessarily like very much or isn't super helpful in the moment for the child. So we're constantly working with interoception in these kinds of ways. We're also working with interoception by need meeting. When I say we're always asking the question, what is the underlying need? How do we get needs met here and follow the need of the child? Um, the gum is one of these ways. You know, I, 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 didn't, I, I used to have no understanding of what gum can do for us, but now we have so much research on it, we actually have whole school districts in our area who are allowing kids to chew gum. If one piece of gum is good, arr, arr, two pieces might even be better, arr, arr, because you're getting this deep proprioceptive and vestibular input to your lower brain regions, which allow your neocortex to focus more deeply and to do the job of things like standardized testing and stuff like that. So they still don't let the kids have gum all the time in their regular learning days, but to make sure they get the best test scores they can, they'll allow it. <laughs> Um, you can also know, you can also learn about a child, how they tend to regulate, what they tend to need, because regulation is not about calming, being calm. Regulation is about upregulating when you need to, to get from a state of hypoarousal or collapse back into an optimal arousal state. Or if you're way up here in hyperarousal and um, you know, being like the hamster on the wheel, to be able to downregulate and come into a grounded state for yourself. So it's cycles of up and down regulating is a lot of what we're doing at Nurture House. And so even the snacks, like children can come in and they might choose some like Sour Patch Kids or something that's really, mm, oh, the, the tart last night at dinner was delicious, but it was, what did you call it on the gill response? Um, it was very lemony. And so there was a moment of alerting to my body because of the lemon tart. Um, some children seek that out. And it's one of the ways you can know, uh, begin to learn, become story keeper for the child in your care, that they need more alerting kinds of experiences to get back to a regulated state. Other children may just want to suck on a sweet lollipop. They may need what they may be asking for is for some calming, right, for some down-regulating. So we also keep a couple of blankets in each room of Nurture House um, because I get cold very easily, and it's one of the ways that I can model for a child, taking, knowing what my body is telling me and taking care of myself. I have um, just the, the most powerful example of this that I've seen in just need meeting um, bottom-up was with a 16-year-old who uh, had come for her very first session with me. She had an eating disorder. She'd had every kind of service you can imagine, inpatient treatment, residential care out in Colorado, psychiatrists, nutritionists, four other therapists before me. She was not having any of it when she came in. She was sitting crisscross, you know, like with doing that with her leg, kind of smacking her gum and looking around the room. And she said, yeah, I think I've dealt with Ed being her eating disorder. She called it Ed. Um, and she just was not connecting in any way. And then she, she, didn't, she wasn't conscious of doing this, but she shivered. And I said, oh, sweetie, it looks like maybe you're cold. And I grabbed the blanket and I just tuck it around her. And you would think that it was a different child from that moment forth. Simply because I read the underlying need and met it in very much the same way that a safe boss nurture story keeper might have done in her early childhood if she'd had that available to her in that way, right? So when we meet those underlying needs, the, uh, you know, the, and, and everyone has them. And our teenagers, I think, are actually at the greatest risk of not getting those underlying needs met. I'm, I'm thinking of a... Uh, um, a child who, I say child, he was big, he was like 250 pounds, he was bigger than me, 17-year-old boy, 
uh, years ago when Hurricane Katrina happened, we had some uh, refugee, some people kind of coming in and and um, taking space in some of our shelters in Nashville. And so they called me and they said, "Can you run a disaster relief group for the children?" And I'd never done that before, and I didn't know what that even meant. But I just brought my toys and stuff that I knew to do. And um, one of the things I brought was a blanket. And when I got there, all the parents were outside filling out the FEMA forms, you know, under a tent. And all these kids were like running crazy inside. Two-year-olds all the way up to 17-year-olds, all just kind of a mess in the building. And so, you know, I brought them together and we started playing some things together. And then I laid down the blanket, and I, because all the grown-ups were gone, I enlisted this 17-year-old hulking boy to help me hold the other side of the blanket. So I'm on this side, and he's over there, and uh, the two-year-old rolls into the blanket, and I, we pick up the edges, and I sing, you are safe here, you are safe here, yes, you are, yes, you are, you are very safe here, you are very safe here, yes, you are, yes, you are, and we lay the blanket back down, and the two-year-old rolls out, and the three-year-old rolls in, and we do the same thing with the three-year-old. And then we do the same thing with the five-year-old, and the seven-year-old, and the nine-year-old, and then we're done. And I go to put the blanket down, and the 17-year-old says, oh, can I have a turn? <laughs> it's kind of funny, but it's mainly not, right? Such privilege to have earned the right for him to ask. It is a huge risk. It is a huge ask any time that our traumatized children invite us to care for them. And so I said, yes, you can, buddy. I'm going to go find a big grown-up, and we're going to rock you in the blanket. So we, did, we finished up the group, and then I did. I found a, a, a grown-up who would help, and we rocked him in the blanket. Most of our teenagers are never going to ask, but they need it. So that nurture piece and that looking very closely. So some models of treatment, particularly behaviorist theories, are very geared towards, you know, praise the thing you want to see more of, and you'll see more of it. Ignore the thing you don't want to see, and it will move to extinction. Right? Trauma play is actually the complete opposite of that. We pay very, very close attention to what the child's body is telling us, so that when we are when a child's at the beginning of an escalation and they're wiggling under their seat, instead of waiting till, if we don't do anything, most of the kids that I see are gonna go, Pum! and they're gonna punch somebody, right? So instead we say, your body is letting me know that whatever it is, that it is we need to do to take care of the body. In fact, a hard ignore can actually make some of these children feel like they are abandoned again. So we're very, very careful about how we bring children in and co-regulate them because co-regulation always precedes self-regulation. If a child is not able to regulate on their own yet, it is going to require a co-regulator, one of us probably, and then hopefully another safe boss who's with them more of the week than we are. And then finally, things like food and drink, and this applies to the parents too. Parents can feel quite nurtured. Since I moved from, you know, my early practice was in like a shiny office building with long brown hallways and big old elevators, sometimes had those cloths on the sides because people were moving desks in and out. And my dysregulated children would just get more dysregulated coming into the building and even trying to get to the playroom. So when I moved to a home-like environment, which is what Nurture House is, the neuroception of safety has just happened much more quickly for the children and for their parents as well. So uh, some of the other things you might, you know, uh, offer to kids, weighted vests and uh, balance boards and uh, all sorts of things like that, weighted blankets. Kinesthetic involvement is something I want us to spend just a little bit of time on. Um, kinesthetic involvement as it also helps children manifest some of what might be inside them and amplify their voice. So um, I have a client who, when she was uh, nine years old, she was sexually abused by an uncle for about a year. She, it was found out. 
She was able to get safe from it. The uncle was going to be going to jail now. But this child was having lots and lots of symptoms. And she had. She was also dissociative a lot of the time. She was having almost a full-on state of collapse at times. Uh, and she came into my uh, building with a... Um, this this cute little dress on and a little bow in her hair and her mother had called and said my child's been sexually abused I just want her to forgive and forget I just want her to forgive and forget which is not unusual for us. In our area, we're in Tennessee in this area, this sort of swath of ground called the Bible Belt where there's like a church on every corner. And so this family, this mother and daughter, had been in, you know, they were in um, a very gender-specific socialized environment about how little girls should be and, and all that. So she came in, and she was very quiet and withdrawn, very beautifully dressed, and she created a sand tray for me that had herself on one side of the tray and the perpetrator, the uncle, on the other side of the sand tray. And then she put all of these army figures in front of herself on this side. And we wondered with the sand tray for a while and processed it. And then I said, can you imagine for a minute that in real time, like you're, you're standing on a giant football field and he's way over there and you've got all these army guys in front of you. What would you want to say to him? And she said, um... Um, stop, please? Like, would that be okay to say, Miss Paris? And I said, stop, please. Those are powerful words. Let's jump rope. So I got a jump rope out, and I got one, and I gave her the other. And I said, can you start with the words, stop, please, and jump rope, and just say whatever else comes out? And it was um, probably only 45 seconds that it took her to move from, stop, please, to keep your hands off me. Whew. Right, voice. Safety, delight, voice. Voice coming from, it's very difficult to get your body kinesthetically involved and not have more connection to your emotion and your lived experiences. So I would really encourage that. I'll give you one other example of kinesthetic involvement. This is a kiddo who was both adopted from uh, Guatemala and also on the autism spectrum. And at this point in time, we've done a lot of work on his social skills development. So you see he's much more connected now. Um, and this book that he has in his lap is a book about adoption. Each page is just a couple paragraphs about a person who was adopted and went on to do something amazing in the world. Um, when this kid came in the playroom that day, I thought he'd been avoiding his adoption stories like the plague. I mean, just with not having any of it. And so I thought, okay, we'll give him this little titration, just a little taste of adoption stuff in this book. And I handed it to him, and he said, I don't want to do this. And he threw it. He wasn't trying to be, he wasn't angry. He just threw it. And I said, well, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to play that game we played last time. And, I, and the game we played last time was these big Joes. The, they're really slippery, vinyl-y pillows. And he stacked them all up, and then he climbed up on top of them and balanced himself, which is hard to do because it's five feet off the ground and they're slippery. So what's he having to do to do that work? He's engaging his core, right? And he has accomplished. He has achieved. He has done it. And now he has the competency surge. And all of that joyful um, neurochemical wash happening in his body, the I can do it, that competency surge mitigates his approach to the harder thing. And he says, okay, now hand me the book. So he's ready for the harder thing now because we have played in ways that have given him the competency surge. That is another use of kinesthetic involvement. And it would also qualify as experiential mastery play. Right? Because he is mastering. He gets this sense of mastery over his own body and the environment. He achieved, he conquered these pillows. Um, and, and part of how we do this is with mirror neurons. So from the moment there's kinesthetic involvement that the child might be having, we might meet the child in that mirroring that kinesthetic involvement. This is a very cool, like, um, snow white mirror made out of corning glass in the corning glass museum we were visiting in New York a few years ago, and I thought, this is the coolest thing. Um, and it made me think, because it was dark glass, it made me think so much of what our children may be enacting, what their stories are, have to do with 
how we're mirroring for them, whether we're giving them something that is, uh, whether they can truly see themselves from us or whether they're seeing some version of themselves based on what we're saying they are or our own distress as the grown-ups. So I'm going to have you watch this uh, video for a moment. This is a um, an early nurture house. We are in nurture house 2.0 right now. We're already bursting at the seams, so I don't know. I don't want to get any bigger, but we, it feels like there's a, there's like a 14 week waiting list. It's ridiculous. And it probably is here too. There are probably waiting lists everywhere here. In the wake of COVID, it has been, it is very difficult to meet all the needs. Um, but if you think about the bottom up brain and am I safe, am I loved, what can I learn from this, I'd like you just to allow yourself to experience the space at Nurture House and asking yourself how does it answer the questions am I safe and am I loved with yes. Play therapy is just, it's the natural language of children. They use words because we socialize them to, but before they can do that, they can often show us through their behavior and then through their play, their perceptions of their family, the scary things that have happened to them. We're also looking at emotional literacy and um, competency building and social skill development. Play therapy is a wonderful medium for all of those things. But most importantly, we see children who have often experienced some great distress, um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, domestic violence. We see a lot of kids who've been adopted because they grew up in neglect or maltreatment environments. We see a lot of families from divorce here. Um, I'm very grateful when we get a family who comes in before the divorce and says, how do we do this in the way that's least stressful for the kids? It's really tough to be a teenager these days. Teenagers often need someone who can listen and help outside the family. We offer parent groups that provide support, education, and coaching for the parents on how to meet the needs that underlie the challenging behaviors of their children. We also help parents co-parent more effectively after divorce. We talk about the paradigm shift that we want to see parents making, and sometimes they do that best in a parent group where they can validate each other, validate how hard it is to be a parent of a child who's, you know, just really more difficult for them on a daily basis. We want kids and families, because they are in great distress and because they're coming from places that are often very hard and very dark, we want them to feel like it's safe here for them. So as they come in the door, even in the lobby, we want to start answering the questions, am I safe and am I loved, with resounding yeses. One of the things that Nurture House really cares about is equipping parents to have a broad toolkit for parenting the child who can be really hard to parent. And kind of traditional approaches have been more behavior management in nature. And you praise the thing you want to see more of and you ignore the thing you don't want to see. And that works with some kids. But a lot of the kids that we see have deep rivers of anxiety that really require parents to meet them where they are, name their feelings for them, and start from a place of connection. Ultimately, for me, I want to bring back the delight between parents and children. I really just have had a vision in my heart for 20 years to be able to have a sweet, safe home that is a place where kids can come for healing with their families. And that's what Nurture House is. So that is called the jumperoo, <laughs> that, that last thing that you saw there. Um, and what I'm going to do now is spend some time, oops, spend some time helping you um, unpack what might be dimensions of enhancing the neuroception of safety that are within your control in your own play spaces that you can offer, that you might be able to augment um, some choice in, because we know that for children, choice amplifies voice, right? And in this room, for example, there's probably several ways the lighting could be done in this room. You could have just the in ceiling lights on and these off. You could have all of them on. You could close the drapes at the windows. You can open the drapes for the natural light. Light, for example, the titration of light can be really important for some kids. Some kids who've been sexually abused might feel a neuroception of danger in this room right now. 
because it is lower in its lighting, more like the twilight light at which for that child the sexual abuse may have been tied in their minds and bodies. Some, although I hate, I don't like fluorescent light at all, but some of our children feel safest in a well-lit, fluorescently lit room because maybe that's what was in their preschool classroom and that's where they felt safest in their own environment. So being able to think through and offer some choice um, to clients can be really useful. And that's in sound and light and color and smell and texture and touch and um, the pressure we would even use in our touch with kids. So um, I worked with a little one uh, who was adopted from India, and she had a lot of sensory issues. You know, many of our tr most traumatized children are not either sensory defensive or sensory seeking, but they're usually a complex presentation of both in different areas. And we're continually doing detective work trying to figure out what's what for these kiddos. So she had been doing some really beautiful work with her mom and they had gotten their relationship, their attachment had just gotten much more secure over time. And so they were sitting there snuggling and her mom was telling a delighting in story is what we call it. Often towards the end of a session, if a parent isn't involved will invite them to tell a delighting in story. We first train them how to tell delighting in stories because not every parent knows how to tell a story to start. Um, they either tell really, really long stories or sometimes really awful, scary stories to their kids. So, um, so she was telling, mom was telling her a story and she was kind of putting her hand up and down her arm like this, just very loving. The mother was trying to give very loving touch to her daughter, but her daughter was going like this. And she was sitting, she was kind of squirming. And, and so I said, let's just slow it down for a minute. Sweetie, do you feel like, oh, I don't like that? And she froze and thought she might be in trouble. And her mom said, I really do want to know how you like to be touched. And I said, let's play a game. So then we played the slippery arm game. And we, we recognized, both of us, that she needs really deep touch to feel connected to the world, to feel connected to her mom. But her mom was giving her touch kind of like this, right? So the pressure, the force that we need, those kinds of things can be important too. As well as movement and physical space itself, eye contact, for some of our kids, particularly kids with neurodivergencies, eye contact may be the hard thing for them. It may feel terribly overwhelming and disconcerting to make eye contact with someone. And yet, not being able to do that at all in any environment is likely to be problematic for them. And so offering titrations of doses, some kids can come right in and we can just look at each other the whole time and delight in each other together. Other kids, if I said, look at me, give me your eyes, give me your eyes, that would be overwhelming. But we might be playing a game in the sand and we, ca we capture each other's fingers and then there's a moment of shared delight and eye contact. That's a dose. It's a little titration of what it is that we want that child to be receiving more of. So this is an example of titrating the dose of exposure as children are learning to speak the unspeakable. So um, we dance towards and away from trauma content. And because of that, we keep little sticky notepads everywhere uh, underneath furniture at Nurture House so that we can quickly concretize a part of story if a child has a part that comes out in the play. So this was the work of an 11-year-old boy, already taller than me at the time. He saw me. And he'd been playing, he'd been sexually abused, neglected, maltreated the first four years of his life. He then came to live in an adoptive family that was beautiful for him, and he got much more regulated. And then we did work together, and he got to where he was only having like one explosion a week. Um, and then he came in one day and said, I want to wash the babies. And that was a very different play than he'd ever asked for before. And so I'm paying closer attention, and he gets the tub down. He fills it with warm water and with soap, and he gets uh, a baby for me, one for him. He undresses his. He has me undress mine. And he begins to wash the head of his baby doll, and he's having me, looking at my baby doll, washing the head of mine. And while he's washing his head of his baby doll, he says, my mama used to shove my face in my baby brother's shit diaper. And I say, that sounds like a really important part of your story. 
Thank you for sharing it with me. And I grab one of the sticky notepads and I begin to write it down while I slow it down and say it out loud. My mama used to, and he comes around behind me and he wants to make sure I get it just right. What are we doing there? We're validating, right? We're, we're naming, we're amplifying his voice. We're also doing a form of play-based gradual exposure. We are in the moment of play that he has shared with me. I am saying we can hold this together. We can, st we can stretch this moment of looking at this together. Just you and me, just for a moment, but it's a sticky note. So then I can put it over here. We don't have to look at it again. Maybe ever, but in this case with this young man, probably nine months later, after we'd done a lot more work, because he would not have been able to do any sort of timeline or sequencing work at that point in his journey. But later, we were able to come back to that sticky note and say, uh, we, we put out this long timeline and we say, so the, the time where with the diaper and your mom, was that before or after the two weeks where you just had ketchup and coffee to eat? And he, nine months later, uh, a year and six months, something like that, and maybe a year and nine months into therapy, he could pull back and his neocortex was more available and he could say, yeah, yeah, no, that, I, I, that two weeks happened after that, right? Some kids though, and, and I was asked this this week, it was a really great question. Some kids are not going to be able ever to sequence what happened to them. Right? We may end up with lots of glimpses and snapshots. When we talk about the continuum of disclosure, that is what I mean. I mean the glimpses and snapshots that children give us over time. There are some models out there of work with traumatized children that would maybe give us this impression that once you have developed safety and so forth, a child can write out or speak out a coherent story of what happened, and that itself is the gradual exposure and the healing process. That is true for some kids, particularly for kids who have had a discrete traumatic event, one thing like a house fire or a car accident in the midst of otherwise a high functioning family system and lots of resiliencies themselves. But most of the kids that we see at Nurture House, the kids trauma play was developed for. Kids with complex trauma and lots of adverse childhood experiences. These kids don't even have a single moment of sexual abuse they could pull out and narrate in a coherent way because what they've had is an amalgam of years of sexual abuse by multiple people in multiple ways, right? And so those kids were not able to say, I don't know if you guys know the, the game Clue, but we're not able to say it was Colonel Mustard in the conservatory with the lead pipe. That is what prosecutors want us to be able to say. But most of our children, the way that they speak the unspeakable is not necessarily prosecutable. It's, I don't know about you guys, but it is one of the most, like it's the part of my work that makes the skin feel like it's going to come off my body sometimes. I know that I know that I know this is happening. And we don't have a way to prove it. We don't have a way to get this child entirely safe. So it may, in, it may be that what you, all you're able, and all is a big all, guys, it's a lot we're doing, is to hold all the glimpses and snapshots together. That may be, there may never be sequence or coherence to it in the ways we would like. Many, many children though, if we show up in a way where they give us a glimpse like this, if we can say with the way we lean into it, I see what you're showing me and you can show me more. I see what you're showing me and you can show me more. We might use our words to say that, but everything about us is saying, I see what you're showing me and you can show me more. So another concept that you saw in the video that I just want to name out loud for us a little bit is mitigating through titration of space for children. So there's a whole chapter in trauma and play therapy on bigness and smallness in space because our exteroception, how safe we feel, can change based on the environment that we're in. I think this is a beautifully sized room for this event today. It makes me so happy. I feel connected to each of you. When I'm um, speaking at like a, a interdisciplinary conference and I'm in um, 
a gigantic room that there's some people in, but it's cavernous. It doesn't feel, I feel a little unsafe. I don't feel grounded in my body. So being able to, you know, the kiddo, the, the, the nine-year-old who was like this in her constriction is going to respond very differently to space in the playroom than the four-year-old boy who's really big in his body and loves to take up space, right? So we've arranged this. This is a chalkboard wall in the kitchen of Nurture House. And this whole bottom area, that four-year-old will come barreling into the room and fill up this whole space with a mural and love it. My nine-year-old would feel completely overwhelmed if I said, fill up this wall with a mural. But if I say, if I invite her to draw a self-portrait in one of these small boundaried frames, that titration of space is small enough, safe enough for her to take the invitation. Does that make sense? Just think about for a moment in your own play spaces, do you have options? for this, for bigness and smallness in space. And it doesn't have to cost a million dollars either. You don't have to go buy circus tents from Target or whatever your version of that would be, Tesco maybe, I don't know. Um, you don't have to buy, spend lots of money. You can bring an old sheet from your house and some clips of some sort. Throw a sheet over two chairs in your playroom and that can become a smallness of space if a child needs to make a smallness of space. So we play around with this in a couple different ways. This is a camp nurture, uh, a camp that we ran several different summers for adoptive children who were at risk of disrupting their adoptions. And this was us playing with another titration. So many of our kids with big behaviors will play in ways, they just don't even, they don't know what their body feels like in time and space. And they don't know what their bodies feel like to others either. So they're often pushing things too much or hitting things too hard or slamming themselves into stuff. So we don't say stop doing that and that's too rough. We do say what's, we play with the idea of what's not enough, just enough, and too much for you and for those around you. Um, so this is just one example of that. This is us using an exercise ball and the kids are just laughing at me because I've already made it go really, really big. I, I fell off it once. Break it. I'm going to break it, right? And, and if I just do like this, that's not very fun. It's not very fun, right? So there's going to be some like little way to balance the ball. Let's just run it, right? Not it's too not, much. No, it's not, it's not too much. much. Right. You want to see too much of that? Yes. <laughs> So we play around with bigness and smallness. We play around with just what's too much, not enough, and just right in different situations until children have kind of learned what their own bodies are and how they feel in relationship to one another. This is just another, this is my daughter and my husband, and I just, it just makes me laugh. This, they, they had put on these big things, and he is not meaning to, he's just trying to say hello. He's not meaning to knock her over again, but watch what happens. Are you, are you having trouble getting up, babe? There, there, yeah, there you go. The sweet boy comes over and helps her get up. <laughs> All right, one more round. Hi. So good. How are you? Oh, that is not. <laughs> Whoops. So we actually used to keep those things in um, at Nurture House. We used to have these big. Uh, whatever they are, poofy, I don't even know what you call them, bubbles around the bodies. And we would play with those in the backyard too. Um, in terms of offering some vehicles for proprioception, vestibular input, this jumper roo, if you only have a tiny bit of space, if you have any outdoor space at all, you only have a tiny bit of space, this is a great tool for both helping children discharge energy in their body and take some risks. But it's also a beautiful metaphor because when a child jumps on it by themselves, they can jump a little bit high, but when they jump on it with their safe boss grown up, they can go way higher. So it's just a beautiful look at that symbiotic relationship. And then, you know, these are other things that you could possibly add something like this to your own playrooms. They're little squishy pads, and kids can jump from one to another. They can stand in one and call it some sort of emotion, standing in or sitting in the anger. All sorts of things you can do to offer the kinds of physical interactions that a child needs as we're learning how to follow the child's need in the playroom. The titration of touch, this is my family, the birds over here. We are 
we, we are constantly getting all, we have three couches in our living room, but we all get on the same one and snuggle together. Uh, we're Italian, so this is just comfortable for us. Um, other kids, this is an adoptive child who has a lot of trouble. He's, he's still very much brain stem. He's working on sensory integration himself, and it's very hard for him to receive nurture or touch at all. So this work we're doing with his parent is, I want to I want to see what it's called. Um, oh wait, it's here. Uh, I don't remember. It's the sitting on a rock or rock on a turtle, turtle on a rock, something like that. It's a yoga pretzels card. Um, and he's playing with touch with his dad, but in a way that allows him to feel like he's He's playing by pulling away, which is going with the normal bent of this child, allowing him to honestly, in some ways, sort of save face with his dad while cooperating in the play. So these are um, things to think about, playing with touch and titrations of that distance, physical distance. Titration of stuff, too, I'd, I'd invite you to think about in your playrooms. And I don't, know, I don't know how the playrooms are set up for you guys or if there's a standard way or if you can add whatever you want. In America, we have some therapists who collect toys, like every toy they can find, they come and they bring it into the playroom. But toys should really be selected, not collected. And uh, this is, and I'll let you learn from my mistakes because I think that's a powerful way to learn. When I started the first nurture house, I thought the art room, just the art room, everything else would be very organized. But the art room, I wanted it to be, I, we took all the cabinets off the doors so that the kids could see all the art supplies. I thought that was a good idea. <laughs> it was not a good idea. It was overwhelming for me. It was messy. It was so now in this in 2.0 nurture house 2.0, it looks like this. And there are still jars in a very, you know, um, single file line on the cabinet, but there's also many more supplies that are behind cool, gray, closed doors. The child who still needs access to all of it will just open all those doors and open all the, um, the drawers and have everything at their disposal if that's what they need. But they're also able to come into a space that is less stimulated. I'd ask you in your own playrooms, and I know I felt this before Nurture House, especially when you integrate different ways of working, you may have supplies that you're just not sure where to put or what to do with, and you can end up feeling a little chaotic in your play space. And I'd invite you to reflect on that just now. Is there any part of your playroom currently that you feel like could be a little bit more organized in its invitation to the children in your care. And what might you do about that? I think coming to trainings is valuable for inspiration and for deep thinking and for seeing your colleagues, but it's really, you need to be able to take some applications away, right? And what are you gonna immediately do in your own environment? Um, so titration of light. Some kids do really well in this beautiful big outdoor space. Others want, this is our new teen room. We just created this in the last year or two. And we have about eight different lighting choices for the teenager in here. You know, teenagers love those LED lights that can change colors and stuff. So there's a way to make it really low lit. And this young lady here is able to do all sorts of beautiful work because she feels safe in the relative darkness to risk more with me sitting in the beanbag chair in the relative dark than she would if we were in a you know, brightly lit room. The same with sound. This is little Elot. This is the pool with the little waterfall that's in the backyard of Nurture House. I did not put this here. I would not put this here. I would not want water like that around Littles if I could help it, but it was there when we bought the property. So we have, a rule. children stay within about three feet of us all at all times when we're outside in the backyard. Um, but that's a soothing sound for many. For a kid like Eli, it would be way too much noise. And we had to find noise canceling headphones for him even in the very first day of camp because noise would have been overwhelming. How do you mitigate noise? And what offerings do you give for your child in this way, your child client in your playroom? And then the safety with skin on part, this is, so, so that was a whole lot just now about how we neurocept safety and offer the invitation to safety in our place spaces. This slide is really more about how we do it with the therapeutic use of self. 
right? So safety with skin on means we used to, you know, there's some, um, some still face experiments, Edtronics work, that, um, that show us very clearly that when we are sort of um, a blank slate, so I don't know if you've watched any of the still face experiments, but it, they're very sweet. You can go out to YouTube and Google Edtronics work and you'll see some of these clips. They put a camera on mom's face and they put a camera on baby's face and then they say play together. And it's very hard not to delight in it because they're just so delightful. And then they say, mom, still your face. Blunt your affect. Don't show any, don't give any feedback. And first, what the baby does is the baby tries harder. And my, my thinking, like my little script for the baby is, I think mommy's on her phone again. Or she's distracted. So I'm going to, I better get her back. So I'm going to be really, really cute this time. And, and the baby's real big. And if the parent still does not give feedback to the child, that child will decompensate. They will become disorganized. They may begin to drool. They may look at the wall. They may loose their bowels. They become disorganized without the co-organizing presence of the other. So we are meant to be attuned and involved and invested with kids when they are with us by our prosody. In fact, polyvagal theory says the prosody, the kind of motherese, we do it naturally. I was in Starbucks once and, um, I mean, a lot. Actually, I was in Starbucks a lot. But I was, I was in it this one day where there was, a, there was like a low wall and a, a line of people waiting in line behind the wall. One of those people was a guy in a three-piece suit. He was like a serious lawyer dude, I think. And he was all buttoned up, but he was going like this. Oh, yeah, oh, I did, yeah. And I was like, oh, there's a baby over there. So I went over and fortunately there was a baby. I don't know what it would, <laughs> I don't know what it would have said about the lawyer if he was just talking to space. Um, but this buttoned up guy, it is in him to do this prosody, this mother ease kind of lilting of the voice because it's one of the ways that children neurocept safety from us. Now, obviously, all in balance, so you're not going to talk like this to the 13-year-old, but I have a 13-year-old client who's been in and out of foster homes her whole life. She knew that her adoption was about to disrupt. No one had said it out loud, including the parent but she knew in her autonomic nervous system. And when she'd come to see me, I would talk to her in a certain kind of way. I'm not even sure what it was that I would say or do, but she said, when you talk to me like that, it makes me feel really good. Because she hadn't gotten it. So prosody and your tone of face and your proxemics, how you move in space, sidling up to kids versus coming at them like this. All of those kinds of things matter. Touch and if and how we use touch and our rhythm and movement. All of those things are part of therapeutic use of self. Uh, and then this is just an example for you. As I talked about that play therapist palette before, this is, these are just examples of, this is the first uh, wave, the very first cohort of trauma play um, certified clinicians, and they're all dear friends and just delightful humans too. But, um, but if we had more time, I would have you make your own palette today. I want us to take a moment too and talk about post-traumatic play and stuck versus energized play. Because this is a critical question that a lot of um, clinicians ask me when they're staffing cases. You know, is this energized play and should I trust the process that this is moving in the way it needs to be moving? Um, or is it stuck and do I need to offer anything else here? And there is no one right answer to that question. It is, in my experience, case by case by case figuring out what is needed with this kiddo and what the play is telling you and what the play is communicating. So uh, I, I do this by comparing and contrasting a couple of case examples. So these would be definitely moments for dual attention, looking out the window, whatever you need to take care of you because they're pretty intense um, trauma cases. So energized play. I had a four-year-old boy who had grown up in domestic violence for the first three and a half years of his life. His mom and dad separated, and he went to live with his mother, but his father would come pick him up at mom's house for visits, which I wish there had been some like McDonald's or some third-party place that they met instead. But this one day, dad showed up. He seemed regulated to mom, and he said, um, can I use your restroom? And mom said, sure. And the uh, dad took the boy into the bathroom with him. He locked the door. 
And he shot himself in the head with his four-year-old locked in that small space with him. The mother was so overwhelmed, she tried to knock down the door with the fire extinguisher first, and then she called 911. So the child was in the stuff of the trauma for about 15 minutes. And being able to integrate the somatosensory experiences related to the trauma will be important for this child. Right? So on the first um, day that I met him, uh, he came into the playroom and I said, this is a special playroom and here you can do almost anything you want to do. And he went directly over to the red finger paint and he mucked around in it. And then he went over to the water source and he washed his hands. And then he went over to the red Play-Doh and he mucked around in it. And then he went over to the water source and he washed his hands. Right? That is cleansing ritual kind of work. And we see it pretty classically over and over again in post-traumatic play. Kids, the, the more humiliating and shaming and dirtying an experience has been for the child, the more likely it is they're going to need an offering from you of some sort of cleansing rituals work. So if you don't already have a water source that is in your playroom or available to your playroom, even just bringing in a pitcher or a kind of a Rubbermaid tub made, um, filled with water, something, some way to have a way to do some cleansing rituals work in your playroom may be useful. That was his first session. His second session, he came into a room that had no windows. It was pitch black. He turned the light off. Then he turned on a strobe light, and he took a uh, sword in one hand, a hammer in the other, and he began to beat up the play tent in the corner. And for me as the therapist, it felt like just it's pitch black and then strobes. It was chaotic, frenetic, overwhelming. He was giving me the external snapshot of his internal chaos powerful, important work he was doing. Third session, he comes in and he takes this tiny alligator and he tucks it behind the sofa in the couch in the dollhouse. And then he takes the big alligator's tail and has it come sweeping through the dollhouse saying, I'm going to make you wish you were never born and destroying everything. Do you see how he's moving over time in energized, metaphoric, embodied play working his own healing process. What he needs from me is to be safe boss, nurture, and story keeper. I see what you're showing me. You can show me more, right? Other kids may come in and be in a repetitive, stuck play pattern. The, the, the other case I'll talk about was a six-year-old six boy with a two-year-old sister and mom and dad. They were all on their way to get school uniforms for the new school year, just a Saturday morning outing. And the 18-wheeler that was on the road behind them um, ran into them. And their car flipped twice and caught on fire. The dad died in the fire. The two-year-old died in the fire. My client and his mother were life-flighted to Vanderbilt Hospital. They were in medically induced comas for three weeks. There were going to be no words for most of that experience. Right, Most of that pain is going to be stored in there. But we know that trauma is stored iconically and somatically. Most of that is going to be stored in their bodies. So he comes in, and, and mom lost part of a leg. He lost an ear and part of his hairline. There was complex trauma, grief and loss, um, body-related issues, and self-concept issues, so many things for them. But the first day, and, and I haven't said this, but it seems obvious to me that if you have a trauma uh, that you know the details of, you want to have the stuff that's like the trauma. So I didn't have an 18-wheeler in my collection at that point, so I went and bought one from Walmart and put it on a shelf, bought a Jeep, a red Jeep, which is the car they were in, put it on the shelves just with the other sand tray miniatures. He came in the very first day, and he took the 18-wheeler, and he took the Jeep, and he put him in the middle of the sand tray. And he went, er, everybody dies. Er, everybody dies. And there's no, he's not with me. There's no affect, there's no connection. He's not embodied, he's not in the space with me. That is a stuck, and I wasn't, I, you know, I didn't interrupt it right then at all, but that went on for two or three full sessions, that play. At which point I start to think, 
When 9-11 happened, no therapist in America would have in good conscience said, sure, just keep watching the footage of the towers burning. Let the children watch that over and over again. So sometimes offering an invitation out of stuckness may be needed for a child. I might do that as non-verbally as putting some rescue vehicles and a doctor's kit near where that child normally plays the next time that they come. Um, as a nonverbal way of saying there's help available to you if you wish to integrate it, right? Um, if the child remains stuck after that, I might get verbal and say, I am noticing that this 18-wheeler and this red Jeep, they keep running into each other over and over again and everybody's dying. I wonder if there's some way to make it safer or better. And sometimes children particularly children who are in an inter in intergenerational trauma pattern or their parent has experienced the same trauma they have and the parent needs to hold on to it in a way that is currently rehearsing the trauma, the child can begin to orient to the parent's need and stay caught in that trauma story that way. Sometimes they just need permission from a safe boss who doesn't need the story to be any kind of way for them to come up with their own solution, their own way out of it. And then if they're still stuck after that, I might offer a menu of options that the child might or might not choose. So in that case, I offered a traffic cop puppet. They can go learn the rules of the road. Um, I have some blocks. We can make a median so they can't get to each other. Oh yeah, Ms. Paris, let's do that. First time I'd seen this kid come alive. Oh yeah, Ms. Paris, let's do that. And then he said, which block should we use? And he went over to the blocks and he, he sorted through them and he got some of the just basic wood colored, you know, regular blocks. He built a median and then he had for the first time in four, I think this was the fourth session, four weeks, the two missed each other. Now that is not a magic pill or any kind of a cure, but we do understand now that our neurophysiology is written in story form, and so if we shift the story even slightly, we may be able to shift the neurophysiology even slightly. So when a child, but this is a, it's a continual question case by case, whether I'm supervising someone who's been in the field for two years or someone who's been in the field for 22 years, we all still have cases where we wonder, is this moving, energized, useful post-traumatic play, or is it stuck or toxic in a way that needs some invitation to shift from the therapist? Does that make sense? Would there be a couple of different ways that that might look? Okay, and if you don't agree with any of this, we can still be friends, okay? You don't have to agree with, you don't have to agree with my way of thinking about it all. So I still see and enjoy the essence of who you are. This part, I'm gonna spend just a few minutes looking at attachment and unpacking that a little bit more for us because I think this is really critical to helping family systems and schools to do a better job of holding kids well. So you can only give what you have received, and many of the parents that I work with have not themselves received much nurture of their own. Sometimes they had to be the um, adult when they were little, starting at five or six, they made dinner for everyone else, took care of the other kids. They don't know how to play themselves. They may need play skills themselves. They may need nurture themselves. This image is the one that reminds me continually of the parents who need nurture this way. This is the work of a child who's living in domestic violence and his mother is the woman in black. He is tucked up under her skirts and he's chosen this two-headed dragon to be the father. He takes a, a cotton ball and he unravels it and wraps the flames around the mother and child together. And that is, they are both in the trauma and they are both going to need the nurture, the safe boss, and the story keeping. Now, you can refer that parent, obviously, for their own intensive trauma treatment, but will you be doing some of the messy work with them? Probably. You will probably, in order to help them be a better parent, you will be doing some of the psychoeducation, and maybe if psychoeducation doesn't seem to be shifting their paradigms, because that's really what we're after more than anything with parents, is often shifting a paradigm. If the psychoeducation isn't kind of landing with them, much like the child stuck play, it may be that their own negative activation is what you're going to need to really lean into with them, their negative activation with their child. And if you do things like mindfulness and grounding and stretching the parent's window of tolerance and they still 
seem stuck, then you might have to get into some reflective attachment work. Some, we call it raw, R-A-W, raw work, because it, does, it is, does make us raw to look at our own attachment histories, but it can also help us make sense of why we're parenting the way we're parenting now. So secure base and safe haven are what we're working to become for the families in our care. And when we have a securely attached child with a good enough parent, then we can use, we can bring those attachment figures in and do things like have that child sitting on mom's lap and mom sings a song. And if you're EMDR trained as well, you can install that safe experience with mom even more deeply. Parents can be in the work if they are already strong enough, good enough parents um, when they are not, though, when attachment runs amok, um, that's where the work comes for us, right? So this is a look at pretty healthy attachment. Many of the children that we see don't have a healthy attachment system. Their parents don't even know what a healthy attachment system looks or feels like because they haven't had it for themselves either. So some of our initial psychoeducation with parents is around what does a healthy attachment system look like, right? So this, um, this powerful piece of knowledge that I just share everywhere I go because I think it's so amazing how we're made. Babies come out of the womb with a visual focal point that is 8 to 10 inches from their face. How far is that? It's about crook of the arm far. We are meant to be in deep and intimate circles of relationship from the beginning of life. Serve and return, serve and return. The adverse childhood experiences impede the serve and return, which is a lot of what we're coming in as play therapists to do after the fact. So when kids get this, they develop a trust foundation. When they don't get it, when they, they, you know, when they smile and they're ignored or wet and no one changes them, hungry and no one feeds them, what does that baby do? Well, I already told you, that baby tries harder and then the baby gives up and stops trying to get their needs met. And what develops for those kids, and I've seen it over and over again, deeply maltreated and neglected children, children who grow up in institutions, they will have a core belief, I must control everything at all costs because I can't trust anyone else to keep me safe or meet my needs. It's actually, I think it's actually even deeper than that for some of our children. It is, I must control everything at all costs. Control versus trust. I must control everything at all costs or I'll die. Right? This is why when, for these parents, it makes sense of when they say, you have two choices. You can wear your red shirt or your blue shirt. I want my purple shirt. You know, ah! It's, the child, it is terrifying for that child to give over even a little bit of control to their caregiver. So we spend quite a bit of time working with these concepts with kids. We also work to help parents understand this idea of co-regulation preceding self-regulation and how important that can be. Um, and I often use my daughter or one of my sons as an example. This is Maddie when she was tiny. And she had just um, bonked her, her mouth on her sippy cup, and it hurt her, so she, I picked her up. You see how she's put her hand on my collarbone right there? This, um, I, I wish I had more. I'm going to come down here for a minute. Okay. So when my kids were little, they would, I, when they were hungry, I would nurse them, uh, and when they were upset, I would nurse them. About six months into nursing Madison, when she was upset, I would nurse her, and she found my collarbone. So both ways of being soothed by me. Six months after that, I weaned her. She found her thumb, and when she was upset, she would suck her thumb, and she would hold my collarbone. Six months after that, she no longer needed to hold my collarbone. She just sucked her thumb. She, she could be over there and soothing herself. Six months after that, she no longer needed to suck her thumb. She could wholly soothe sometimes by herself. But do you see how that being wholly soothed by the other thousands and thousands of repetitions of time is how she learns, how she develops an internal capacity to self-soothe. Almost all of the traumatized children we see, if they have three or four or more ACEs, have not had that scaffolding. They just have not had it. So it has to be us who comes in and offers all of these repetitions of attunement and need meeting and delighting. 
And if kids are, if the parent is still like, really, you still want me to co-regulate? She looks like she's 12 years old and she shouldn't need this from me anymore. If you show them an fMRI scan, that can go a long way towards shifting the way they think about it. So this is the front, uh, the frontal lobes, and here you see the temporal lobes circled. This is the brain of a healthy child. Um, the temporal lobes are implicated in emotional regulation, so you see how available this is for the healthy kid. This brain is the brain of a Romanian orphan, and do you see the almost complete lack of functionality in the temporal lobes? This child's brain has no current functional ability to regulate the emotion. Needs the caregiver to come in and co-regulate it more effectively. So as we think this through, and we wonder a lot, and you know, I could give you several more hours of content about how we teach parents to co-regulate and the soothe strategies we use and so forth. I just want to offer you one guiding principle that I think that I try to share everywhere I go because I think it's so important. There's a big question in the field um, between different camps of work with kids when, you know, we should use behavior management. No, we shouldn't. We should use co-regulation. No, we shouldn't. We should, again, be, trauma play is yes and yes. When would we use behavior management and when might we, what, when might we soothe? When might we co-regulate instead? So I was working on a project with a bunch of behaviorists and then I'm the attachment theorist in the room and we had a lot of tension between us, uh, cognitive dissonance around how are we going to put these two m ways of working together because they don't feel very good uh, when you put them together. And we came up with this guiding question, is the child in his choosing mind? Is the child in his choosing mind? And what, what this means to me, um, and I usually use the example of my daughter who's given me full permissions to tell her story. When she was three years old, she was very strong-willed, um, like her mama, uh, but she was also, uh, had some sensory issues. So if her socks didn't line up quite right, she'd get very upset and things like that. So in any given moment where we might see her as disobeying or defying or non-compliant, I had to ask this question, is she in her choosing mind? Let's say it's um, 9 a.m. and she's had a good night's sleep, a good breakfast, and we're playing together in the bonus room, uh, maybe puppets together. Her neocortex is engaged. Her imaginative capacities are on board. And I say, please put on your shoes. It's time to go to the store, and then we'll go to the park. And she ignores me or she says no or she, you know, whatever kind of defiance happens. I have to ask myself, is she in her choosing mind? I'm going to say yes. Mas First of all, she's pretty securely attached. And also Maslow's hierarchy of needs, all those needs have been met and her neocortex is available. So I'm going to say you have two choices. You can put your shoes on in the next five minutes or we won't have time to go to the park afterwards. That's the natural consequence of not putting your shoes on. And hopefully she'll just come in line and put her shoes on so we can both have fun at the park later. But even if she doesn't, it was still good learning for her, even the consequential part, because her neocortex was on board, right, to choose. Let's take the same child, three-year-old girl, but now it's 9 p.m., and I've kept her out all day, and she hasn't gotten a nap, and she's exhausted, and I'm exhausted, and I say, please put your pajamas on, it's time to go to bed, and she says, I'm not going <laughs> to. If at that point I say, you have two choices. You can put your pajamas on by yourself or you lose your book at bedtime. I am setting her up for failure because she has outlasted her ability to regulate herself and she needs me to come in and co-regulate her more effectively. Right? Practically speaking, with traumatized children, that often looks like treating them like they're a couple years younger than their chronological age in those moments of overwhelm. It might even be younger than that. The parent will tell you in the intake, they will say, I don't get it. He can make 105 on his math tests, but when he's, when he's upset, he acts like a two-year-old. And I will say, that is such wisdom, Mom. That's exactly right. I think he probably has the coping of a two-year-old when he's socially or emotionally stressed. And that begins to shift the paradigm some for the parent as well. Okay, so if this is cortisol, ah, then this is oxytocin. 
And oxytocin is the bonding chemical, and it is present between moms and babies during the moments of nursing. It's released in both of their brains and bodies, which is marvelously remarkable to me, to bond them closer together. It is also released during other forms of healthy touch and play. So we can simply by playing with a child, we can offer the oxytocin and dopamine that I almost see as, and I know this is oversimplifying it, it's a heuristic, but really I almost see as an antidote for the amount of cortisol stress hormone that may be flooding a child's body. So play is powerful in this way as well, and touch is one of the primary ways that it can come. And this is my very favorite picture of touch. These are twin babies who were born premature in the early 1970s. They were put in, at that time, little plastic incubators, each under their own like heat lamp to keep them hot, keep them warm. Um, and one of the babies was doing well, the other baby not so well. And the nurse pioneered a protocol of putting the one baby in the crib with the other. And her sister, who is a premature, moments-old baby, throws her arm over her sister. And this baby's heart rate regulates. Because we are meant to be connected in these deep and powerful ways. So touch is, you know, and people, um, I'm very gratified these days because the Association for Play Therapy in America has a paper on best practices in touch, recognizing that touch has many therapeutic values. Janet Courtney has a whole volume on the power of touch now, edited book. So we actually have in our um, consents at Nurture House, we have a touch consent in our informed consent. And it does not say, can we touch your child, yes or no. <laughs> it says... Here is what we believe about touch in therapy uh, and all the various ways that we would be using it. Uh, and then here's a list of references that you can read if you want. And feel free to set up a session and talk to me about it. And we won't actually take a family if they, will, if they are disallowing touch of any kind. Because it doesn't feel safe to me. It's part of what didn't feel safe about some of what we were doing during COVID with kids, with young kids especially. Parents were really happy for their children to go into the bedroom with us on the phone or the iPad, and while they do the dishes, we play. But if you're working with a four-year-old and they start to climb the furniture, they start to climb up the dresser, you can set a limit, but you can't enforce the limit. You're not physically present to do it. So at least for safety, we, we want to be able to do, to be able to touch the child. We've only had that, I think we've only had three families ever who've been who just couldn't get their heads around it at all. And that's fine, we referred them to some colleagues that we trust who don't work in the same way. Um, the idea though of touch as re-traumatizing is an important idea. And it's one that needs to be carefully considered. I used to have, when I used to go to multidisciplinary conferences for abuse, there would always be someone in the room who would raise their hand and say, aren't you afraid you're gonna re-traumatize the child by touching them? Yes, of course, we need to have carefully conceptualized the case. We need to know, and the, and the underlying question should always be when it comes to touch, whose need is being met here? Whose need is being met here? Why are we instituting touch at this time and place, right? And I'll say, you know, I learned this from a, an FBI guy at one of these multidisciplinary conferences, I was sitting, um, after the conference, we were sitting in the bar areas, lots of us together as colleagues, and I sit, and he'd done an over, undercover sting kind of thing for human trafficking the year before, and I, so I was just fascinated. And I said, so how do you guys learn about counterfeit money? Like, do you just send it, every time there's a new one, you send it around and everybody looks at it? And he said, no. He said, actually, we spend all of our time with real dollar bills. We hold them up to the light, we smell them, we taste them, we know what a wad of $10 bills feels like in our pocket so that when we come across a phony, we'll just know it. Do you hear that parallel to, par to healthy touch? When a child has had enough healthy touch experiences, they have an uh-oh button that gets wired for something that's uncomfortable. When they haven't had those touches, they have to get touched somewhere unless they don't, which is the other part of touch. You may have a child who is touch averse, 
or who physical proximity is going to be much more co-regulating for them than touch. And then the whole way in which you approach and use your body very carefully uh, in the space with them may be the most healing quality. So it's not, I'm not in any way saying touch all your children and do it all the time. But I am saying understand the power of touch and as we do with everything else in trauma play, nuance your case conceptualization for how can this be harnessed for the needs of the children that you serve. Okie dokie. So this is just one more example. This is me trying to read a book to kids in Camp Nurture, and I thought I'd only get a page in, and then we'd have to say, your bodies are letting me know that, and get up and wiggle around. But we got through the whole book, and I couldn't figure out how till I saw the picture taken by one of my assistants later. What do you notice is happening with all three of those children? <laughs> to a one, they all have an anchoring touch that their buddy is giving them. Now, I did not train the buddies to... I didn't say during circle times, you know, during nurture groups, put uh, a nurturing hand on your person. I did teach them how to attune to the kiddo in their care, and that's what they were all doing here. So an anchoring, to, I think if we had more anchoring adults in classrooms, even if, they, it'd, be, it'd be best if they were trained, but even if they weren't so trained, if they were anchoring grounded adults, I think we'd have less behavior problems. Okay, so attachment figures can bring their own yummy neurochemical cocktail. And even when they're no longer with us, and that's, this can be an important part of the play therapy work, when, when it's related to a parent dying, this was a case in which a child had, uh, this is a um, dual attention for me, because it's still very hard for me, this case. Uh, this was a five-year-old who was just watching TV, and his little brother was with him. His dad was doing work in the study, like I'm doing work in the study all the time. His mom was at a dinner for work and um, he went in to get, asked dad if he could get a snack and dad was slumped over on his desk, had had a heart attack. And the five-year-old knew enough to call 911. He knew that was something you should do. So he called 911 and the person on the phone asked him to do compressions. <laughs> So my little five-year-old got on top of the desk and, you know, tried to do it and then until the ambulance got there. And what do you think is my child's core cognitive distortion? <clears throat> I killed my dad. I, I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't big enough. I didn't have enough force to make this happen for him. So that's a, I could give that, I have another hour's worth of material on that case example. But what I want you to see is after we had shifted his understanding and we had to get autopsies and we had to get a doctor to talk to him and show him some stuff and we had to push as hard as we could on some stuff and not be able to fix it and um, for him to realize he hadn't killed his father. But then what we did was this really beautiful work where his hand, we, we, chose, we made a cutout hand for dad, and then we put his handprint, we painted his hand, put it inside. And his mom and his grandmother were both there in this session, and we were naming all the ways in which he is like his dad, the ways in which my daddy is in me. So we can even harness the attachment, the warm fuzzies of the attachment figures who are no longer with us, if we're thoughtful about that in the playroom with kiddos. So how bold one gets when one is sure of being loved. I love this quote. And I'm going to finish up our time by talking about some synaptic storytelling. And I get pretty geeky about this kind of stuff, so you'll have to forgive me in advance. But I start to say, okay, what, what all do I need to share with people? And this is actually an older brain. My newest version of this also has cortisol and oxytocin and dopamine. It has all the sensory uh, portals. It has all sorts of things in it. But I do want to make sure we're thinking about synaptic storytelling, how we're wiring the brains towards healthy stories. Um, left, right, right? Left brain, linear, linguistic, just the facts, ma'am. Right brain, holistic, iconic, visual, spatial, um, gives us the context of how we know. 
So we want kids to have both left and right, right brain ways of knowing, we want their parents to have left and right brain ways of knowing. Um, implicit versus explicit memory, yeah, we want to know, understand that too. Um, Neurochemical washes, yes, we want to understand that too. So synaptic storytelling is just my way of trying to put together all the neurophysiological understandings that we have. And then um, story in different ways. Help children speak the unspeakable in whatever ways they need to, beginning with rhythm work. Many, many kids did not even get that initial rhythmic story of um, cadence and predictability in any way. So they may need to do rhythm work before they do anything else. And the way I think about this, this is something that I myself created. Isn't it cool? <laughs> I made it in, um, there's this, uh, this something, it's called Discord, it's a way to talk to people. And you guys probably know more about it than I do. And, um, and within that there's a, a server or an app called Mid Journey, and it's an AI artificial intelligence kind of thing. And so you can put, my oldest son turned me onto it, he was on his computer and I was like, would you just get off that computer and come talk to me for a while and we can go on a walk. And he was like, I'm doing something really cool. I was like, really? And then he showed me and it really is cool. <laughs> you just put in some words and then it generates some images for you. So I put in heart, brain, and then a couple of colors. And I might have put in held, heart, brain, held. And it gives me four images. I choose the one I like the most, and then I can tweak it, and it will give me four more images based on that. It's a whole, when I'm in Vienna doing the advanced trauma play retreat, we're going to spend a whole sectional just doing this, just figuring out how do we create visual images that, because they're satisfying, it's part of the power of play therapy. The tools themselves, the symbols are satisfying. The expressions, and this is just a new, newer expression. And so I think about this like the child's heart and mind in the middle there, held by the parent's heart and mind. And the synapses that begin to story who the child is become very important. I'm actually in the middle of working on a research project on the baby story. Um, if you're familiar with TheraPlay, the Marshak Interaction Method has one of the prompts is adult tells the child a story about when the child was a little baby, beginning with the words, when you were a little baby. And so we look at that, and uh, some parents, you know, they, they will look at it and they will go, oh, I get to tell you a story about when you are a little baby. Come here. Come over here and sit on my lap and I'm going to tell you a story. And they tell this delighting in story and it's clear that they enjoy the story, the child enjoys the story. I'm not sure what it means, but I really think it means something when a parent-child dyad presents that way in the nurture house dyadic assessment. Something related to that adult's attachment representation, something related to the adult-child <coughs> attachment pattern, and maybe something related to that child's de developing self-concept. If that's true of the delighting in, come and let me tell you, other parents, I've seen thousands of these now in Nurture House, so um, another way it can look is, don't tell the child about, I just, I don't remember. I don't remember when you were a little baby. I'm not exactly sure what that means yet, but I, I think it means something very different than the parent who comes in and tells the delighting in story, right? And means something for the lived experience of the diet. How this brain shaping, heart shaping, brain shaping, heart got shaped, right? The third way that can look is when you were a little baby, you cried all the time. And I could not soothe you. We could not figure out what was wrong. We would have to drive you around all night. We never got any sleep. If those are the stories being told, that's kind of concerning, right? I mean, I'm not sure what it means yet, but we are doing some research to try to figure that out. Oops, there's my rhythm piece. This is, that's a, a little guy who, um, I say little guy, he's 16 now, but he's been with me since I felt him as a little guy when he was about nine or 10. He's a child who is going to need, um, someone asked me the other day, how many sessions do you have kids in at Nurture House? When we're doing things like divorce adjustment and or um, just some skill building in an area for a child. They might be there for 20, 25 sessions, something like that. Maybe even shorter for some kids. But some of the kids that we see with complex trauma may be there for years and years. And some of them may be there, they may need someone, an external co-regulator for a lifetime. 
that may that peace may never go away for them. Um, so there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. When is a story needed? I think it's needed in all of these cases. If you think about your own caseload for a moment, a story may be needed when there's a deafening silence, when no one in the family can talk about what has happened. A story may be needed when there's a vacuum of information. A story may be needed when there's lots of misinformation. When I'm thinking about a, a mom who her daughter had been sexually abused by a babysitter, and in those cases, we're always asking, what do you call the private parts? Do they know their names for their private parts? And she said, well, we've been calling her private parts bottom and front bottom. Front bottom. That's a lot of misinformation. That's not, it's not a front bottom. Uh, incongruence. Uh, when the parent is saying, it's all fine, it's all fine, when there is no fine. I was telling my group this week that we just had a very, very dark tragedy in Nashville, um, the Covenant School shootings. Um, a, a shooter came in with an assault rifle who had actually gone to that school at one point and uh, shot up the school, killed three third graders, and killed three adults. And they're now asking me and other people like me in the community, what do we do, what do we say, how do we hold all this? And there have been a couple therapists who got out on Instagram or somewhere and said, just reassure them that they're safe now. Tell the truth to the children. They were in this, they were, they were in the space while their, while their peers were shot and killed. What are we saying? And whose need is being met there? When we don't name it, when we don't bring it in the room, and when PTSD symptoms exist. But for me, in a vacuum of silence is when I think it is most important for us to bring it in the room. So I will begin bringing it in the room pretty early on with kiddos, and I will say something like, one of the things I know about you is that your brother took his own life by suicide last week, or whatever it might be. That's a, a recent example for us at Nurture House. Because I don't want any child, when I was working in a fully non-directive way, what would happen sometimes is a child would be using some of, if not a lot of, their psychic energy with me wondering, do I know what has happened? And can I hold what has happened? And if I can tell her, when should I tell her? And how should I tell her? And will it overwhelm her? And, and they've already had to orient to all their other safe boss grown-ups in that way. I want them to know what I know. And then we can go right back to play. We're not, I'm not going to ask you 20 questions about it. We're not going to make a sand tray about it today. I just, I just want you to know that I know it. And then we see other kids who have this stuff happen. And we're right here when you're ready. And then we go right back to play. So. Um, due to time, I think I'm going to move us along. I will share this Becoming a Container slide um, that I shared with my sweet colleagues. I had so much fun the last three days. I see Clive in the back. Hi there. I, I had so much fun with these guys over the last three days. Um, one of the things that we do at Nurture House to stretch ourselves to become containers for whatever the child might bring us is decide what what things are still overwhelming to us in the whole world of atrocities that can happen to people, right? When I got into the field, I worked with um, a lot of sexually abused kids, but I myself had not had many sexual experiences yet in my life at that time, and certainly had not had sexual abuse in my history. So I knew there'd be things that came into the playroom that were gonna be way too much, way too hard for me. And so I started making lists of all the sexualized body parts, sexual acts, sex, 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 that I could think of. And then I would pick the most, and if we had more time, I'd have you do this too, so you're welcome. We don't have more time. <laughs> um, so I would pick the most personally, viscerally repulsive word to me, oh, the one that makes me back away from it, which was cunt. It's not anymore. It has no, that word has no power for me now. But at the time, I made up, I knew that, that if, if a kid said that to me in the playroom, I'd lose it. He would feel, or she would feel, my pulling away. And so I created the cunt song, <laughs> which goes like this. Cunt, 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 cunt. 
and I sing it seasonally into my bathroom mirror. <laughs> my husband's like, oh my gosh, here she goes. She's singing that song again. <laughs> but he knows why I do it. And it was, it was not quite a year ago that I had yet another child come in. And as we're playing in the sand, she's saying, then he says, you cunt, you get on the bed. And I have to be able to say, and then he says, you cunt, you get, if there's anything in me that backs away from saying that word that he said to her as he hurt her, that to me is a little bit unconscionable that I wouldn't be able. And if you aren't able the first time, it's okay. But be able the second time. Right? That's what it means to become a container. Keep stretching yourself. So that if something is triggering for you, often we don't know what is triggering for us till it's already in our room. And it's already happened. And maybe we've already ruptured or made a misstep or, or backed away or whatever. It's okay. Be compassionate to yourself. And then stretch. Get with supervision. Get with a peer. Get with somebody. And stretch yourself to be the container that's needed. So trauma narrative. Um, you have these slides in your handouts. I'm not going to go over all this. These are pieces of trauma narrative work. I will share an example here. One of the goals, and you all have been sent this handout, and it's going to have probably more stuff in it than you actually would even want, so that's fine. Um, this quote by Cohen Manorino and Devlinger, who created trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which some people compare trauma play, like some of the goals of trauma play that we achieve through play are very similar to some of the goals in other best practice models in the field. This quote, one of the goals of creating the trauma narrative is to unpair thoughts, reminders, and discussions of traumatic events from overwhelming negative emotions, right? So unpairing the reminders. That can be done, uh, according to the TFCBT, in, in written form and in storytelling, uh, you know, narrative gradual exposure. I think it can also be done equally well in play therapy. And I'll give you the example that is most powerful to me that was taught to me by this 10-year-old girl. Uh, a 10-year-old who was removed from her home because it was a human trafficking uh, hub, and she had had such perverse sexual abuse that when they removed her, dual attention, when they removed her, she had semen in her ears. That is how obscene her abuse had been. When she came to the playroom, she presented much like a typical child in her exploration of the room until she got to the corner that had my art supplies. And then she pointed to the glue and she said, I'm not going to touch that stuff. And I said, you decided. You're not going to touch that stuff today. I think I said, you're not going to touch that sticky stuff today. You'll know when you're ready to touch the sticky stuff. And that, my friends, is a different thing than a strictly non-directive reflection. It's stretching, it's adding on the futuring hope that one day she will be able to take that back. For her, what trauma has stolen, she will be able to take back. And so she looked at me kind of weird, and then she went on. It was like a minute of our session. We did a bunch of other things. And then the next time she came in, she went over right away, and she looked at the glue and pointed to it. And she said, I'm not going to touch that sticky stuff today. And she was like, come on, tell me what you tell me. And I said, you've decided you're not touching that sticky stuff today. You'll know when you're ready to touch the sticky stuff. And so for six weeks in a row, that's how that went, that dance, just a moment of our time. Six weeks in, she came in. She took the glue out of its pocket. She poured a little puddle of it on a piece of paper. And she said, I'm not going to touch that sticky stuff today. And I said, okay, you're not going to touch that sticky stuff today. You've decided. You'll know when you're ready to touch the sticky stuff. Six more sessions that went on. On the 12th session of her journey, she came in. She put the big glue wad on the piece of paper. And she went, and I'm going to do it the way she did it. It was like a horse blowing air. She went, and she put her hands in it, and she made a glue picture, like saturated it with glue so that it had to be peeled off the table. It was so saturated. She's unpairing the association between the sticky stuff of glue and the sticky stuff of the semen, right? Taking it back, taking back what the trauma has stolen. So I believe that play therapy is a powerful way for us to do this. This is some of the ways that we digest the story. I think what I'd like to do, guys, is move ahead. I want to make sure I give you at least one example of story keeping before we end. 
Would it be okay to go five more minutes over the 1215? Is it okay if we go to 1220? Is it okay, Marie, if we go to 1220? So I think I want to share with you one example. I have lots because I like to share lots, but I'm going to share one example. When we get to the story keeping, assuming we've regulated and we've connected and we have dozens and dozens and dozens of ways we do all that in trauma play, but once we have gotten to the story keeping, what we mean by that in trauma play is <laughs> taking the big behavior that we see now and threading the needle all the way backwards to the child's earliest experiences. And so what I'll, um, and in the back, is it Andy or Kyle? Could you go ahead and move the PowerPoint all the way forward to a safe circle, the first slide of a safe circle? Uh, I'm going to tell you a story while he's doing that. So um, threading the needle all the way backwards, there was a young boy. I, I met him when he was five. He had been born meth addicted in another state. It was the worst case of meth withdrawals they'd ever seen in an infant. He was on the highest doses of morphine possible. He would, and his adoptive mother, when she brought him at five, um, he was all kinds of hyper aroused and dysregulated, all the things you'd imagine he would be. Um, but I said, tell me about that first month when you were with him in the hospital. And she said, well, I would hold him like I held my biological babies, he, but he couldn't mold to me. He, was, he would stiffen, he would scream, he would cry, he had fevers, he would seize, have seizures, he would have saliva running down his face, he would pass out. He would, all of these terrible withdrawals from the meth addiction. And so now let's fast forward. He's five years old. And we're trying to help him just to regulate at the beginning of work. And we're also doing some bits of TheraPlay with him. And um, I'm starting to look, kind of do the boo-boo routine and looking at his body. And, and he's got a little mark on his knee. And I say, oh, buddy, it looks like you had an ouchie there. Um, I said, can you tell me about it? And he just went like this and uh, looked out the window like, this is a lot of intimacy, I don't know what I think about this. And I said, Dad, how about you tell me? You're his story keeper, you tell me about this. And he could, the dad told me the story of him falling down the driveway and how he ran to you know, help him and all this kind of thing. And, um, and I said, it sounds like he might need a Band-Aid for that, Dad, and I offer Dad the Band-Aid. Dad goes to start putting the Band-Aid on the little one and he throws a massive tantrum. He, he just really, really, really acts out. And if you didn't know his story, you would think, He's rejecting his parents. He's out of control. He's an oppositional defiant kid. You'd think a lot of things about him. But I felt his tension, and I keep blankets around for this reason, too. I just shoved the blanket over to him. I said, Dad, just keep looking at me, Dad. And I shoved the blanket over, and he went, Whoa. and he, caught, he, he pulled himself in instead of throwing the fit. He pulled himself in, hid under the blanket. And I said, Dad, just keep your eyes on me for a minute. I'm remembering a story of when he was a little baby. And when he was a little baby and he was just born, Mom had had some yucky stuff in her system that I think was in his system. And then it took a while for that yucky stuff to get out of his body. And while it was getting out of his body, his body hurt a lot. I remember you telling me that his body hurt a lot. And, and there wasn't much. People could try to help him, but there wasn't much help to get the pain to stop then, let's call him Johnny. So baby Johnny might believe that there's no help available for him. Nobody can help him. But big boy Johnny knows you're right here and that he can, he can get a Band-Aid from you that you will help. You'll come running down the driveway to him when he hurts his knee. And Johnny, from underneath his blanket, he goes, and he kind of sticks his knee out. <laughs> The rest of him is still covered, but he sticks his knee out and allows his dad to give him the Band-Aid. Do you see how that story, that's taking the big behavior we're seeing right now and threading the needle all the way back to the earliest origins of the behavior, right? So story keeping. So thank you for moving it to this slide for me. A safe circle for little you. This is, I want to read this for you, over you in some way as we say goodbye for the day, for the morning. This was my therapeutic response, like my own therapy for me, in response to a parent and child that I saw together. This three-year-old boy whose mother had had a psychotic break when he was six months old. 
And part of that psychotic break was questions about had she sexually abused him or not. I actually think all that was psychosis and it hadn't actually happened. But she had worked her way back to trying to be with this three-year-old and they'd asked for some therapeutic reunification work. So I took on the case, assured that they were going to reunify whether they got therapy for it or not. It was just going to happen. It had gone through the courts and it was happening. And so I helped the mom and the child start to learn each other again. It was beautiful work until, for like three months, until one day the child and the dad, tall, lanky dad, teeny tiny child, were standing in the lobby waiting at 8.45 a.m. on a Tuesday morning, and mom didn't come. And she didn't come, and she didn't come, and the little one stands looking out the back window of Nurture House and says, <coughs> Maybe she's not coming because it's cold outside. And we found out later that she'd had another psychotic break. She was very ill. And she, was, and, and she had lost her chance. That was her chance to be with her son. She was never going to now have, maybe until he's an adult, relationship with him. And I had facilitated it. Ooh! It was just, I, I just felt really horrible to me, and I was trying to figure out how do I make sense of this. So this, is, this book came out of that, but I think it is also a book for all of us and for what you do. Once upon a time, in an alphabet far, far away, lived a little you. Little you always stuck together with Big O. Little you couldn't remember a time he, when he hadn't been with Big O. Big O loved him, took care of him, showed him the rules of the alphabet, and was his safe circle. Big O could make herself small to play with little U, and together they made a powerful combo. As they stuck together, they told bullies to get out. They helped little ones not to pout. They made sure no one was without. Every day was a new adventure, and every night when she saw little U begin to get sleepy, O would make herself big again, and little U would hop inside her snug embrace and sleep soundly. Then one day, Big O got small and stayed small. Little U didn't understand why she couldn't get big again. He tried making her big and strong in his own way. He would pump and pump, but slowly she would deflate again. She would start to lose her shape, and he would try to make her be like she used to. But nothing he did seemed to work. Finally, when he was looking for one more way to make her big again, she quietly rolled away. Little you was alone. Word spread throughout the alphabet. They noticed that Big O was gone, and several letters tried to help. Big T invited Little U to sleep on him. Little U tried just to be polite, but he was afraid he would fall off and couldn't relax. Not really. Big C invited him to curl up in her curve and rest, but her side was too open, and it just made him miss Big O more. He couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep, and he had lost his ability to make words. He wanted to shout, but he couldn't even do that. The whole alphabet was troubled, and word spread from letter to letter, further and further down the alphabet, until it reached the Q. The Q had always longed to stick together with someone, and said to little U, I would very much like to stick together with you. Little U didn't mean to be rude, but blurted out, you are too small. The Q thought about this and said, I can grow. I can learn to be bigger. And little U took the risk to stick again. After a while, they both found out that when they stuck together, they could do special things, amazing things that no other pair could do. Together, they quenched fires, made quirky quadrangles, and they went on lots of quests. And Q learned how to stretch herself. She became a capital Q, and together they could quell an insurrection, make the bad guys quake in their boots, and quiet the fears of little U. One night, when they were both tired but happy from their latest quest, Q took a risk of her own. Would you like to slide up and sleep inside my circle? I know I can never take the place of Big O, but, but I can give you my safe circle whenever you need it. 
Little Yu felt a surge of hope. He had secretly been longing to crawl up inside Q Circle for a while now. Just as he was gathering his courage to jump, he froze. Pictures flashed through him of the times, towards the end, when his safe circle had caved in on him. Q came close and said, I know it can be hard to trust that I will keep my shape, that my circle will stay strong, but I have something that Big O did not. Little Yu cocked his head, curious now. See my base? It's like a kickstand. It keeps me stable. I will not roll away. Even if you try to push me away, I can't go far. So let's just stick together and keep making beautiful words. So they did. <laughs> the end. Thank you. Thank you. Our big Q holding us. Oh, I am the big Q holding you at this moment. You are all big Qs and very safe circles for all the people that you shepherd and help and hold. So thank you for doing what you do and enjoy your lunch. Take care, guys. Thank you. You're welcome.